Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Force 5. I'm Ken Plume. I'm your host. This is my show. This is the show where I have a guest on, and we talk about their five favorite Star Wars collectibles from their collection. We just have a conversation about them and whatever comes to mind. It's a, it's a wonderful little discussion with some wonderful people. And the wonderful person in this episode is an amazing author and presenter and just all around just social media, internet, content. I'm not going to use content. Forget that. I'm never going to use that again. Creative <laughs> Maven. Maven? Uh, wow, Bonnie I haven't heard Burton. that. I haven't heard the word Maven in, since 90, the 90s, Web <laughs> Maven. Bonnie, it yes, but I am I am Bonnie on? Burton. Nice to nice to see you. I was trying to remember the last time I saw you in person, I think was backstage at Woodstock. Whenever they did a Woodstock. Left, 2017? 17 must have 16? been, right? 2016. It hadn't been after 16. I want to say 17 was like their farewell. Hmm. I don't think I had moved to LA yet. So I will say it's 2017. Because 16 was a weird year. It seems like it wasn't 16. It's hard to remember things pre-plague. Yes, yes, in the uh, various the various <laughs> plagues that have that have affected us. I know it existed. Years. Yeah, I mean uh, it is what it is. It's I was trying to remember how long it's been more than ten years that mm -hmm. I've known you. Mm -hmm. Maybe closer to fifteen. Uh, maybe I don't even remember how we met. Probably at a at a comic book convention, probably yeah. or one of um Adam Savage's like comic-con get-togethers and when they first started in his hotel room ages ago now yeah. they're like big deal parties but back then it was just then it was just getting shut down for noise complaints then it was, yeah but it was always the same couple every single comic-con had a apartment or had a room right next to adam's and it was like did they not learn the last time and it was like every single time it was the same people and then i remember we moved it to the basement like it was a conference room or something and that was awkward because people kept walking by wondering what it what was happening in there it looked like a family reunion at like a holiday inn uh conference room or something or yeah and then uh yeah it looked like comic cons in a small town yeah and like then at the VFW adam, hall yeah and then adam moved it to a restaurant which was also awkward because we only had part of the restaurant reserve so people like kept trying to sneak in and then they did more uh they, they keep trying they well they did yeah they did try to sneak in yeah and then they um and then i think adam just gave up and was like screw it it's a rave now so then he like started selling tickets and like i think all of us that normally went as his friends got vip status but then we were surrounded by everyone in a really like like uh claustrophobic dance club in uh san diego uh, during Comic Con, and also I think he had all of his cosplay costumes on display that he's always and some done of the secret props cosplay. And um, oh, I know, I remember. I was standing right next to Guillermo del Toro, and I remember I was having do? a panic attack because I was like, I can't, I can't. It's too many people, it's too many people, and I could not find the exit. It was like it was not a quick exit because there are people in the way, and it was packed. And it yeah. was loud and it was like, ah, and I was just like, I have to get out. I have to get out. I have to get out. But he also was trying to get out, I think with his assistant. And I, I remember he looked at me with like this, we both shared a look of panic and he looked at me weird. And then of course, because I'm an idiot and I'm awkward and don't know what to say in front of my heroes. I said, oh, this is like a never ending labyrinth. <laughs> I even think I did the, you know, the thing. And he just looked at me like, oh, crap, I'm next to an Uber fan. Oh, like no, I'm, I have two escapes I'm not to next make. to a normal person. I'm next to someone who thinks they're being clever. And I'm I have stuck to escape next this to club her. and this conversation. Yeah, I've had many a time where I've uh, said hello to my heroes and had them give me a look of utter like despair and 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 horror because I said something goofy well, and dumb. And well, they Adam's thought I was some weirdo fan. And I am a weirdo <laughs> fan. So, yeah. But Adam's so. parties were really good for setting up those awkward and and unexpected meetups i mean i would say the same bunch. yeah i would say the same about uh the backstage at woodstock uh woodstock because it was, was everyone that was key. performing well it was everyone that's performing right and then it's everyone 
that's close friends with the performers. And then it's also people that are like dating the performers, but then it's also uh, a couple of plus ones that probably shouldn't be there. And then I don't, I, I was there. I don't know what category that I fall under. Cause I did go on stage a few times to perform, but other times I was just there as friend so of. I, I never performed at Woodstock. I never, I, I mean, never asked. I never asked I to walk thought, on I stage just... and be part of anything in the background. For me, it was the green room. Yeah. The friends in the green room. Yeah. That's the where the fun was. And that's where the real that, fun was. Yes. That was like yeah. the best, the best way to do any of those sort of yeah. interactions. I think I had lively debates about Ewoks eating Han Solo with quite a few members of the back, the people in the green room. And then, uh, also, it was just, you know, fun to like hang out with friends you hadn't seen forever and people you really respect in the industry and people that are really funny. And yeah, it was a good time. It was like little mini summer camp. I mean, that's what Comic-Con always felt like was summer camp for me. But yeah. And the, well, the fact that yeah. Woodstock was usually like the Thursday night. Yeah, it was during Comic-Con. It almost so... was like a letdown after because you kind of got all your fun, low key not stressful interactions with people where you're not trying to chase people down to yeah. hang out and say hello out of the way. So everything yeah. else after that felt like a, an anticlimax. I to mean, that experience. It was weird. Cause I've gone to comic-con every comic-con since 1996, I think, or mm, maybe around that time. I don't remember before it was like this big thing. And oh, I mean, uh, when they didn't have the whole convention hall. I was there yeah. in 90. That was a time that if you stood in line for Stanley's autograph and you were a girl, which was very few of us, he would have you sit with him. Oh, Stan. So that was fun. Uh, also, you would get to, it wasn't as chaotic as it is now. I mean, now it's like a well, multi million dollar industry. I but, mean, you um, didn't have the industry presence. I mean, I mean even when I, I, even when I started at Lucasfilm and I manned our booth for the first time, we didn't have a huge Star Wars booth. We were, Lucasfilm, uh, Star Wars booth, uh, is trying to sell hyperspace, which was the online fan club. That was what Bantha tracks became. And for the, because we, they didn't shell out for any real banners or any real any signage. We looked like a janky Star Wars fan club ISP. Like we didn't even look like legit. Yeah, you look like I had the to change like, my mind meme. You were yeah. Sitting. I had to like go to Kinko's. <laughs> I had to go to Kinko's on my own dime and make stuff. So it would look more legit because. Cause we, no one believed I worked at Lucasfilm and I was like, no, 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 this is look, Steve Sansweet's back there putting stuff away. Like, and, and buying stuff. Well, that's all. That was the whole purpose of the booth for the longest time. I thought was just to store Steve's stuff because it was like, <laughs> clearly that's what he was here, there. I mean, he was there to do panels and stuff too, but it was like, yeah, I would go back there and it, the pile just kept getting bigger. I'm like, we didn't bring this. What, where is this coming from? And it was just Steve storing stuff back there. But, but... that certainly was a change in the convention and seeing yeah. when the media companies, it was the, I think the first yeah. change really felt when the dot com money came in in 2000. Well, I don't think it was just that. I think Hasbro figured it out. I think the video game companies figured it out and then the studios figured it out. But, and when, so... but when that, that VC money, that initial flush of 99, 2000, when, when all the internet companies got money and decided to out. Yeah, but there wasn't other. that. Cause I was part of that. Before I went to Lucasfilm, I worked in tech and that was not the case. We had an influx and then a crash happened. Oh yeah. Well, so I mean, like huge, immediately after like 2000 huge, was the high water huge mark. crash. Yeah. There was a huge, cause I was going to E3. So I worked for at home network and app. I worked for Apple, then at home network, then excite and then Nullsoft. And we were going to gaming conventions like E3 and then also like, you know, Macworld and all the like, you know, Gen Con and stuff like that. That's where the money was at. It wasn't at Comic-Con yet. In fact, the first dot com bust happened in year 2000, I think. Yeah. And then um, uh, it was and I started at Lucasfilm in 2002. So there was no big time Comic Con anything happening until no. two thousand. I would say two thousand five, two thousand six. Six, right? Probably two thousand five because that's when Reve I think Revenge of the Sith was coming out, and I remember we had a pavilion. We had like what you would call a pavilion, what it is now, which is but like this huge deal. What it seemed like the the movie studios started convincing yeah. whole cast to come down, and it turned into more of a celebrity showcase, almost like the show West yeah. of nerds. Yeah, like it was, it, and I did, these, yeah, these, and these I was, uh, I was sent down to do show West. So I, I, I totally know what that trade show versus Comic-Con and Comic-Con started as a trade show. And then it turned into like this, it was like a trade show fan hybrid. And then some years it felt more like a trade show and some years it felt more like a fan thing. So 
and you got uh-uh. to see E three go in the opposite direction of start as a trade E3 show was, and then decide yeah. it wanted to be an open to the public convention. Uh, yeah, E three was. I don't think E three ever found its what it wanted to be, no. and it was. And that's why it no longer exists. And that's why it no longer exists. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't know. Like I went to WonderCon just a couple of weeks ago, and I hadn't been to a convention. Well, I went to L A Comic Con last year, but the, I could roll out of bed and go to L A Comic Con. So this doesn't feel. It, you know, it doesn't feel like because it's the it's at the convention center. I've been going since it was called Stan Lee's Kamikaze Con. Right. Uh, so I've been going to LA Comic Con for a while, but which is super chill, super nice. Like it's just a fun convention. Uh, a lot of cosplayers, lots of families. Like it's not, there's studio stuff, but it's not a huge studio presence like you would have at Comic Con San Diego or Comic Con New York. Right. Uh, but I, the one at WonderCon, I hadn't been. I hadn't been at WonderCon since it moved to Anaheim in 2013. I was at WonderCon in San Francisco when it was there all the time for Lucasfilm. That was our home turf Comic-Con. Uh, but yeah, I hadn't been to WonderCon since it moved to Anaheim. So I went and it was really fun, but I'm so out of like shape, like just in general, mentally, physically, ADHD brain just trained, the... all that stuff to deal with the sensory overload and the fact that you're on your feet all day long and you have to be energetic on panels. And I was on a couple of panels that I'm really glad I was on, but you know, it was just, and also I don't work for a big company anymore. So I'm freelance mostly. Uh, I do like, I just did a game for magic, the gathering. I did a, a, a murder mystery game for them for wizards of the coast and Hasbro and beetle beetle and Grimm's. Um, and I did hunt a killer games for two years and those are immersive murder mystery games but they don't have a huge presence at, at comic-con magic the gathering probably does but not hunt a killer uh and then i was doing other stuff with other game companies like goliath games and some others luminous but you're mainly Blue, they're representing started. yourself you're there to represent yeah and you. also i you know i try to publish a book or a comic every year and i put that on hold to publish games so i've been publishing games for the last two years um the last book i wrote was a scholastic book fair book which i'm very proud of because it came out during COVID and it was called live or die survival hacks. And it's like Mythbusters book for kids. It's like, if you've been Hanseled and Gretled into different climates, how can you survive with right. just the stuff in your backpack? And it was nice to be in a scholastic book fair for a book that wasn't a star Wars book for change. Cause I've written a lot of star Wars books that were, so that was nice, but um, I haven't published a book every year. So I'm getting back into that. So I'm working on a couple of books right now. I'm working on a comic right now um i might kickstart a game i'm thinking about doing a murder mystery game but my the one i always wanted to make so and it would be about drag queens so that's something that i'm thinking about doing but i don't know if i have the brain space right now to fully do a kickstarter because i know how much work that is and i think <laughs> i think we all know how much work yeah. that is and it's yeah. Particularly, it's something, it, it, it never gets easier. It's only gotten harder and harder. It doesn't. And I just did a, I just got on an anthology called When We Are Young, and it's a, a queer friendly comic uh, that's going to be benefiting the Trevor, Trevor Project. So it's a charity comic. That, and it's a, a project I'm really passionate about. But the organizer organized it on Backerlit, which is a new crowdfunding uh, space that, that I like did not know about. Centric or a, yeah. Uh, well, I think I've seen games and books and art, and the, it's, uh, it runs the gamut. I don't know how it's different than Kickstarter and Indiegogo, but there's more and more of that popping up, I've noticed. So we might see an influx of that, especially I mean, certainly the way a space things are now. Competition when it comes well, to... I mean, the problem now is every all of us are looking for work. All of us are looking for paid gigs, and it's a it's no. brutal. <laughs> brutal. I got turned down twice for, for jobs I knew I could do in my sleep because I was, quote unquote, too experienced, which is just code for you're too old. Uh, but legally, they can't say you're too old, so they're just saying you're too experienced. I'm like, wouldn't oh, you, you know too someone? much? You know too well, much. Well, You've it's done... like, wouldn't you want to hire someone that can do this job like impeccably, make you look good? I'm not after your job, and the base pay is more than I've ever made in my life. So it's kind of like not I'm, after competence. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not ambitious. Like I'm, I'm pretty chill. If I find a job I like, I'm cool with it. Like I don't. I did that. I mean, I moved up the ladder a little bit at Lucasfilm, but I wasn't like, I want to be an exec. I want to be a VP. Like, no, no, I liked my job. I liked, uh, you know, interacting with the fans and being kind of the was online. So I was the social ladder? media person. Huh? Was there a discernible ladder at Lucasfilm? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, there was. I mean, if you look at who's where they're at now, yes, 
100%, but I think there was also... Or was that a make your own path kind of? Well, ladder? I like think if there you was were also and you found positions or created? there's probably also some politics going on that I am not good at. Um, if if this was a Star Wars analogy, I would be Gronk in the Senate. Like I'm not. <laughs> I would be. <laughs> I would be the mouse droid in the Senate, not a senator. So I, you know, I'm not that type of person. I'm not. Uh, I'm not clicky. I'm not. I'm kind of like group hug for everybody i'm not politicky i'm not clicky so i don't i don't know i don't know and also it's a different company now than when i worked there i right. i left i was gone before the disney takeover happened so you know it's just a different it's a different space you were doing different an stuff. independently owned small company um, that was sort of organized yeah, around the output was, of one person well when i was there it was run like a family not a business which is probably not the best way to look at it um because once i was pushed out like a you know foster child they didn't want i was <laughs> i was uh i was uh pretty devastated but i will say um you know there's people still there that i adore i love tracy canobio uh she's uh, in charge of publicity i love dave filoni i will always love dave filoni he's he's such a good guy and he's so talented and he loves the fans he loves what he's doing he appreciates and respects the material um yeah. So it's like, you know, there, there's a, there's a handful of people that I still talk to and uh, Pete Vilmer is great too. He's in publicity. I worked with him in online forever and ever. And I, you know, when I was there, it was a different world. Um, now it's, I'm sure very corporate, very Disney, but I'm glad I was there when I was there. Cause I get to do, I got to do a lot of innovative stuff that no one else was doing. I got to kind of create my own job uh, as a social media person before that was even called social media. I was a community manager that it turned into social media because I said this is important and we should be paying attention to this. And so I'm glad I paved the way for Star Wars and Indiana Jones social media, <laughs> but you know, and also for the Star Wars YouTube show, paved the way for that and paved the way for lots of things. But um, you know, also they they I was there my all my 30s. And so when I turned 40 and I wasn't there anymore, I went to go work for Stan Lee, which who was another great person to work for and did geek geek DIY uh show for him on his youtube channel and that did really well and got to uh work for to write write for playboy which was great when it was still around so i was writing all the geeky stuff do you for miss playboy. Doing stuff like because geek diy yeah. you know going back to that and and that sort of period post lucasfilm yeah uh, was sort of you getting out there as yourself mm -hmm. like you you would run a lot of the stuff and obviously had a lot of bylines yeah. during your time in lucasfilm i mean i also had like i had day jobs with big companies like i i worked as a social media director for uh uh discovery channel for their youtube division but there's a difference um, when you're you're now on camera you're getting in front you're doing things where you're getting out there as yeah yourself. well i always was on camera that's the funny thing before i worked at lucasfilm i was on camera i was uh i was a vj for a long time for like an mtv2 type affiliate uh pbs denver it was called uh teletoons which I put some of this on my YouTube channel. So if you yes. really want to see me in my <laughs> Winona Ryder 90s rockabilly Betty Page look, that's what I was doing. Um, but also uh, at At Home Network, I had a, a vlog called what, uh, Ask Bonnie and Ask At Sock. At Sock was my version of Syphil and Ollie from MTV. Um, that was a show I did for five years. That's also on YouTube, but it predates YouTube. So right. basically so this I is what, did is all this YouTube player? stuff. This is all converted <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was converted. You can tell. You can tell it's converted from real player to YouTube. When you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see all these videos uh, from the 90s. It's very 90s. Um, but I did that for five years and that predated YouTube. So I kind of showed up too early for a lot of things uh, that, you know, maybe I would have made I Justine money if I had been like 10 years later. But, you know, I did that. And then um, during my reign at Lucasfilm, I did a lot of video stuff in front of camera. In fact, there's there is some videos of me doing stuff in front of camera. And then um, for Lucasfilm uh, that before the YouTube show, uh, the Star Wars show. But I also had stuff on the side I was doing. I was appearing on the guild felicia day is the guild uh i was on will wheaton's show tabletop a few times uh felicia and i had a book club show called vaginal fantasy romance book club show that we did on google hangout we had like 69 episodes ha 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 and that's on my youtube <laughs> and felicia and i still do a show we do a, in fact we aired it today we do a book club show once a month it's just the two of us um on her felicitations 
uh, podcast, but also on her Felicia Day Twitch channel. It's also on her YouTube. Um, and I also do a podcast show, video show with Renee Ruin and um, Jenna Hayes. That's called Night Shift, and it's a horror film podcast like this, but we dissect one movie that's either created, like directed or written by a woman or has a strong female lead. Um, Renee Ruin is like this superstar goth chick in Australia and Jenna Hayes is an uh, adult film star here in the United States. And what was the last so we have like, covered? Uh, the latest film we did, uh, a girl walks alone home. A girl walks alone at home at night. A girl walks alone home at night. It's the Iranian vampire black and white Western that came Never out a few years this. ago. It's really good. It's um, I think you can find it streaming in a lot of different places, but we've done other movies too, like Hellbender, uh, The Love Witch. We and we sometimes will interview the filmmakers themselves. So we did that with The Love Witch. We did that um, with Persuasion. I think Jennifer Reeder, and we did that with um, the Adams Family. No joke, they're called that. Uh, it's Toby and her family that make these movies. Like uh, I think it's The Girl at Rums at Night. Uh, I think that's right. And then uh, Hellbender. And those are on like Shudder. They're like a lot of them are. A lot of the movies we, we review are genre horror on, you know, uh, like IFC movie Midnight or A24. Right. So like, you know, the typical stuff like um, Under Her Skin, the Jonathan uh, Grazer movie, the guy who did um, uh, A Zone of Interest. I just watched that last oh, night. The, the, the one that Oscar winner. Oh, my God. Don't watch that. At, first of all, if you are going to watch it, watch it with headphones because the whole point of the movie is the sound. Second of all, don't watch it right before bed. Not a great movie to watch before bed. <laughs> About the Holocaust? Not a great. No, no. No. You should maybe watch, I don't know, Lisa Frankenstein before bed. Not yes. that. Uh, anyway, so, yeah. So, I have a fun time. I, so, I do stuff in front of camera all the time. And, in fact, I'm probably going to watch. a show that was built around you and crafting and well geek diy was yeah. geek diy it was through a production company called uh Vuguru, who were they did a lot of independent tv series that were on hulu i was a i think i was either approached by them or the stan lee people like, asking, like another show that's seen before it's time oh like, yeah totally totally and it was it was um a time when i believe uh youtube was offering big money for studios to do studio big things so it was like geek and sundry and nerdist were doing things and i was doing stuff with them because vaginal fantasy romance book club show was a geek and sundry show before legendary took over uh and then we just moved it to felicia's channel i don't know what the deal was i don't know if legendary thought it was too girly girl or the name was too scary for them because vagina was in it um, I mean, but, but are got... any of those geek and sundry shows I don't think any at legendary. I mean, around. I mean, yeah, just they everyone took all their shows back who were able. Well, to, it wasn't it that they took it back. I think legendary decided they didn't want any, they didn't want to spend any money on anything scripted. So right, all the stuff that was like I think Mark Hamill. I don't know if Mark Hamill was a show. No, I'm thinking uh, he was on Stan Lee's channel. Yeah, he did the collection. Uh, show, but right? like we had a bunch of stuff. Like Amy Berg was doing stuff. Paul and Storm were doing stuff for uh, ner uh for Geek and Sundry. Felicia obviously. Oh yeah, um, I mean all the the scripted. Yeah, all of stuff. that. Yeah, I mean, you can still go on the channel and see a bunch of cool stuff. It's just, I don't, again, I don't know what, what the a status weird era. is. It I was mean, a weird era. Yeah. It was also one of those eras. Nobody has done the documentary yet on all of the weird internet eras. Oh my gosh. Well, I, you know, it's funny because I tell people, you know, YouTube is basically what public access used to be, right? Because all of us that are old enough, I was on public access. I did a lot of public access shows. I was a puppeteer on one. I was on a drag queen show for a while. I was uh when i you know when i lived in colorado i was in a bunch of them and then san francisco i was on one called subculture which was another music video show that i vj'd for for a few years and um i'm I just talked to felicia about this today because she got a v a vhs to digital setup Converter. and i have all my vhs's <laughs> just ready to go to like all be the filling out that youtube, YouTube channel soon yeah. right yeah, so it's like all my public access stuff and then all my VJing stuff. And then I was a go-go dancer for years for bands and stuff. And that's all recorded. So I, I don't know. So there's, You've there's possibilities. You've had so many lives. Well, it's just, here's the thing. Life is so short, right? And I didn't think I was going to last this long, full disclosure. Uh, so I'm shocked I'm still here. I'm happy I'm still here. But I always tell everyone this. Um, life is short. You never know when your number's up. So Pursue the fun stuff you want to do, even if it's not adult or profitable, <laughs> even if you can't monetize it. Boy, the internet gonna, really taught us to embrace that. If it's going to make you happy. I mean, I did monetize everything because I came from very humble beginnings. So I, I care about making money, but 
at the same time, you know, you don't have to monetize every tiny, every little tiny thing you do. Right. Um, because the podcast shows I do now, they're not for money. They're just for fun. But I, I, you know, I, I've done a lot, but I think that's just because I wanted to try a bunch of stuff and I was good at a bunch of stuff. And also I keep pivoting. I wouldn't have gone into game writing if CNET had not laid me off as an entertainment writer due to some weird California contract law that came up that said you couldn't have a contractor for longer than two years uh, unless you hired them as a staff, and which they were not going to do because healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> So I, you know, uh, hunt a killer games and came a call in. And if I, if I was still working at CNET, I probably wouldn't have gone there. Just like I got a Lucasfilm film job because I applied for a very cryptic job posting on Craigslist for something that didn't say what it was. It said it was marketing, but I didn't know it was with Lucasfilm. And I had already been in like the running for a job at Google and Facebook and uh, some other tech companies at the time. And I went, once I found out it was Lucasfilm, I went because- Do you remember what the job listing said? It, it was something to do with like uh, marketing, with movie marketing or something. And to be honest, you know, I, my skill set was editorial at the time, but I had been doing, I guess you would say crossover editorial marketing and community management with um, At Home Network, which of course became Excite at Home and then ended- uh, and then I was with Nullsoft, which created the Winamp player and Shoutcast. Uh, but that got bought by AOL when we became AOL Music. But then everyone got laid off unless you moved to New York. And I was not going back there. So I was like, eh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll apply for everything and anything because I was just desperate to get a job. And, and you're, you're uh, still I in San Francisco at this point. Oh my, I know I was, I had moved from San Francisco for a year to live in the mountains of Santa Cruz, Cruz called, it was called Boulder Creek. It was the middle of nowhere because I was living with a bunch of hackers from Nullsoft. I was dating one of them. So I moved in with them, got a dog named Sophie who became my like soulmate forever and ever. I uh, had her for 17 years. So that worked out great. But when we, when I broke up with my boyfriend, I had to move. And I was like, well, I guess I get better go back to San Francisco. And that's the same. That's the Lucasfilm job. Just the universe was like, you know what? Bonnie's been through a lot. We're just going to go <laughs> ahead and let her apply for this Lucasfilm job. Let's see what happens. And I didn't think I was going to get it. I walked into the lobby and there were a bunch of dudes looking very smart and, you know, the quintessential Star Wars nerd look. No women. I was it. Now, so was I was a, like, was I don't know. Was this had the Presidio already? This opened? is at the no Presidio. Presidio, Presidio was... didn't show up until after Re Revenge of the Sith. So we didn't have. Oh. We were at uh, Skywalker and Big Rock, Big Rock Ranch, which are right next to each other. Um, and uh, yeah, so I went. I went up there. <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna get this job. And that's There's a no drive. Place. That's not. Well, that's not... I thought for sure that it was like. Uh, and also it was a two hour commute, uh, one way, by the way, cause yeah, I was coming from ridiculous. Aptos. I was coming from Aptos, which is even farther than Santa Cruz. <laughs> uh, I've, I, you know, once I got the job, I went and got a place in San Francisco to rent, but, uh, it was also a contract job. So it was only supposed to be for six months. And I think because I did my job and every, a ton of other people's jobs and I was staying late at work, I think it, and also they had to pay me overtime. So I think because they had to pay me overtime, it's cheaper just to hire me as a staff person. Um, but also I think they just like what I brought to the table because I brought a different energy, a different fandom because I was a big Star Wars fan. But to be honest, I was also a big Indiana Jones fan and I was in charge of writing both of those sites up um, and doing all the message boards and doing the kids section and oh, message boards, doing everything. <laughs> yeah. And then the blogs, I suggested we should have fan blogs and that was a brand new thing no one else had done. And it was a big deal. So like, I'm, I'm very proud of the work I did there. I'm very proud of the work uh, we did there at online as well, like with Pete Vilmer and Pablo Hidalgo and some other folks involved. And, you know, it was, you know, a team effort, but also we, we very quickly became a family uh, was dysfunctional as well. Like, you know, not, we didn't always get along, but you know, it was a good time in my life. And I look on it, I look back on it fondly, but also, you know, sometimes when you, are at a dream company, you forget sometimes that you were uh, very disposable. <laughs> you And also I had people there that were really protecting me for a long time, making sure I stayed. And then when they left, I think I had a big bullseye on my back. I didn't realize it, but at the same time, it was fine. Cause like, I, I'm so glad I got to work for Stan Lee. You know, I got to work at Playboy as a writer. I got to write for CBS for seven years as an entertainment and weird science reporter 
Um, I wrote a bunch of books. I got to do two DreamWorks books, a Harry Potter, uh, like a, I shouldn't say a Harry Potter book, but like a behind the scenes coffee table book of how all the props are made and all the Harry Potter and Fantastic Beast movies for Inside Editions. I got to write a bunch of comics. I get to work on games and, you know, I, I'm very, I feel very fortunate even though I'm still, even though right now I'm struggling to find work and I'm just desperate to get any kind of paid work. Also, no, no one who stayed at Lucasfilm or came after got to marry R2. That is true. And that was all my idea. And I'm very proud of that. We're still married. We have a open source marriage, uh, which means (laughs) he gets to date other robots. I get to date other humans or human-esque people. Um, What was the pitch for that? Well, Well, it was, it was, we were doing um, wedding uh celebrations at at star wars celebration i I don't remember which one was it indianapolis maybe or la can't remember which star wars celebration it was was maybe la revenge of the sith then yeah 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 but it was i think it was seven i think it was la because it would have been before the 30th anniversary year right yeah i don't remember i I went to all of them so i went to every single star wars celebration (laughs) when i was there so they all kind of blur together unless they're an international unless it's japan or the uk all the us ones kind of blur together because i know there was a florida one and an indianapolis one and then an la one there's just a lot of them and uh i can't remember which one but it was the one where we first introduced that you could get you could have a star wars wedding it's not legal legal but you would get to uh go down you know you wear whatever you're gonna wear and then you go down like a regular wedding and it's like a chapel that's like built open open air chapel built in the middle of the you know the huge star wars celebration area and um you could have i think you could have either darth maul or which i had or uh darth vader or somebody else marry you i think obi-wan was the other one um and then you get like a full package like like i think you pay 20 bucks or something and you get a certificate you get a wedding video that's shot by our like emmy award-winning documentary team which i thought was (laughs) kind of funny uh and then also you get like um a wedding photo and you get to keep like all these little trinkets and stuff and i'm like well i'm not getting married anytime soon so let's and i pitched this at a marketing meeting and i remember everyone thought i was kidding until i actually did it and i was like no 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 this will be great because this will get us free press no one's marrying R2D. No one's ever married R2D2. There's been like a behind beneath that, the dome. That he's let anyone know. There was like a beneath the dome <laughs> like documentary about how he was a ladies' man that I think was on the Attack Attack of the Clones uh DVD. I can't remember where that was, but yeah, he never got married. Lando. But he nope, he never got married. There's no canon of him getting married. I am the first to marry him, and I'm still married to him. So <laughs> uh no, we did it was fun. I, I made a whole blog thing about it. And I mean I wish you could read it, but everything I ever wrote for Star Wars.com I think has been deleted years ago. But is any on the internet archive? Um I put on a I mean, ironically, a lot of it's on my live journal. So I still have it on my live journal and I post it every once in a while. Um I don't even know where the video is, but I think there's a snippet of it in one of the YouTube videos I made for Lucasfilm about romance and Star Wars. I think it's in there in the beginning, but uh, I I made a big thing out of it. I made it like an article series, like I was Joan Didion or something of Star Wars. <laughs> and so I did the thing where I'm like, okay, we're going to meet at speed dating because there was a speed dating thing. So we made it look like R2 had just showed up for speed dating. By the way, I had to fight women off of him just to get photos taken because as soon as soon as r2d2 rolled into speed dating it was like he was a chick magnet and it was just like come on i'm doing a shtick here do you here. remember who like, was operating him for that celebration i don't remember but whoever it was thank you because you saved me multiple days because we had to do this over multiple days it wasn't just in one day so like the first day was speed dating the second date was a real date in the g4 hoth bar that was made of ice g4, so we had another relic of that past right so we, it was a G4 had sponsored it. It was an ice bar. So it was basically a bar in the middle of Celebration, which is, you know, in a co- convention center. It's made of ice. So I don't know how they kept this thing going uh, without melting constantly. We went in and took some pictures of me buying him a beer or something. And there's some pictures of me like all like, yay, I'm having my first date with him. And then he proposed. And then uh, the next day was the wedding that and we advertised it. That was very forward of our team. Very whirlwind, very whirlwind. Droids don't mess around. <laughs> and so his side of, of the wedding was all droids. So every single droid from the R2 Builders clubs that had come together from all over the world, all over the country, there was every droid imaginable. We had the mouse droids as our flower girls, which was very sweet. So they came out first. And then my side was like a hodgepodge of Rebel Legion and 501st. So it was just like, you know, whoever wanted to sit on that side. 
And it was a uh, Steve Sand Sweet walked me down the aisle. Uh, my maid of honor was Adrian Curry, who was at the time like the first winner of, a, of America's Next Top Model, huge Star Wars fan. But she was, in, of course, gorgeous. And she was in this like all latex imperial guard universe uniform or something and looked amazing by the way never do that if you're gonna get married ladies don't have a top model winner as your maid of honor because she will definitely hey, steal everything she, she, she didn't she steal r2 no, we, she uh, didn't get r2 can i tell you we got so much press because of that because people outside of our universe thought i was seriously marrying a droid so jezebel did a takedown not a takedown piece on me but they made fun of me relentlessly um tmz covered it i think paris hilton care like per perez hilton also all the like gossip rag because it was adrian curry was there she was my right. maid of honor so of which, course which fulfilled exactly the promotional publicity hey we got so much press for that i guarantee you we would have not gotten any press from tmz if i had not done that so we got a ton a ton of pr primo press uh so for star Wars celebration because i married r2 who was but R2 then the other destroyed the other thing was uh, his mate. So his best man was Vader because duh. Boy, Vader made him. boy, take that. Vader made him. I take mean, even though we had, <laughs> even though we had Darth Maul marry us, it's pretty much canon, right? That Vader, Vader made R2. So of course, right. That makes sense. But the funny thing is, I think um, one of the C-3PO cosplayers tried to break up the wedding via the graduate, like had a, like had a you know like ah like he was trying to stop and then elvis trooper dra dragged him away from the wedding which was so funny because we got it where is all the b-roll this oh my god the, we got so much video for that like it was so funny we used that video so much on starwars.com and then um and then afterward and then of course i gave him a power converter as the wedding ring i got a r2d2 wedding ring i have somewhere around here and uh we had uh photos taken afterwards that were very sweet and every you know people still to this day on twitter ask me how r2's doing and i'm like oh he's fine and you know if i see pictures of him with another girl on like instagram or something i'll be like i expect you home at a certain time <laughs> but what a, what a weird considering that that was really before the widespread oh yeah uh, use of of smartphones so yeah, you wouldn't have was... had a ton of people in the audience taking no. video of the thing. There wouldn't have been fan no, video. That there was no about. iPhone yet. There was no iPhone yet. So it was, I don't even know if where we were in flip phone technology at you that had point. Maybe a lot of Nokia pictures. I, I mean, I snapping. took a lot of photos with my digital camera. And uh, in fact, you can see them all on Flickr. If you go to and do a search for star wars like r2d2 wedding bonnie burton or lucasfilm see this is celebration r2d2 on Flickr. you'll find them all on Flickr. they're there you were just they're on my instagram they're on my instagram i posted you, them all there <laughs> you were just involved with the star wars holiday special documentary oh yeah disturbance in the force there needs yes. to be yeah the marriage to r2 documentary <laughs> dig out license however i don't know, by hook I don't by know how that would that work roll footage out of them pitch it to them as a fun thing to do maybe See what happens maybe i mean it couldn't hurt right i yeah the star I mean, wars your, your, your wedding anniversary has got to be coming up it's i know i gotta look that up uh the star wars holiday special documentary that you mentioned the disturbance in the forest uh directed by kyle kyle newman well produced by kyle newman i think there's a bunch of directors involved there's a bunch of people involved that are amazing um and also great people are in it um seth green of course uh, who's great in it? Uh, Brian Ward, Ward from Shout Factories in it. He's great. Um, I'm in it. Yay! Uh, but also, then you got people that, and also Patton Oswald. You know, you have. I think there's only three of us from Lucasfilm officially that were in it. Uh, I think Steve Sansweet's in it. Uh, Jonathan Rinsler. It's his last interview before he passed away from cancer. He was the head of pub Lucasfilm Publishing forever and ever and ever. He's he wrote a lot of those behind the scenes books uh, for uh, Star Wars. Indispensable. He's, so end up, I mean, I, I, I'm so glad he got to do this because it was such a weird thing to, for him to do because, you know, in Lucasfilm, we were not really allowed to, as Lucasfilm employees, when we were employees, you could not promote the holiday special in any way, shape or form because it was kind of person not grata. It was like the step stepchild in the basement, you know, like we're not allowed to talk about. And so I, you're not I pitching loved an article it. for starwars.com on the holiday special at that time. Well, no, we didn't that I never did. We, I think we talked about 
No, we did it. I, uh, well, I wasn't I, allowed I to. I would think you couldn't even mention Life Day. I mean, that was, no, I would, was ver- I would verboten. sneak it in. Like, I snuck it into uh, the Star Wars craft book that I wrote uh, because I have, um, see this little, see this little Bantha? That's the Bantha that Lumpy uh, gets torn up in front of him by that horrible, you know, stormtrooper guy while they're looking for secret plans when they storm the house during the Star Wars holiday special. And also I had a lot of B. Arthur stuff I would kind of sneak in and uh, Harvey Corman stuff. And, uh, but it was online. So like a lot of times we would sneak stuff into the online site and they wouldn't notice for a while. And George wasn't look, I don't even think George cared, but you know, it was whatever it was. It was the rule that we couldn't do anything. And then when I left Lucasfilm, I was like, oh no, I'm talking about holiday special all the time. So when I wrote for CNET, I was constantly writing about it. Uh, when I wrote for uh, SFX magazine, a British magazine, I had a column in there once a month. I wrote about it there too. Like I was writing, I wrote was it for, it, about it for Playboy. I wrote about it for Playboy. Was so it I was accessible definitely internally? Like, could you have gone to the library there and asked? No, no, to no. Watch there's it? no copies. I would. So I would do a secret screening every year on Life Day for anyone who wanted to watch it. Um, and I had DVD of different releases. So if you, it was only aired once in 19, in the 70s. Um, it's in between, uh, you know, A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. The reason it even existed was because uh, the, you know, the 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 studios thought, oh, and this is before Lucasfilm is independent, mind you. They were like, oh, we don't think anyone's going to remember Star Wars. But this was an era where you could have a movie in a theater for years. Um, there was no turnover rate like it is now. And, right. uh, you know, and also the people who wrote the holiday special were the writers for the Carol Burnett show. Back then it was variety shows were standard. Donnie and Marie was a standard show. You know, Mandurell sisters, Cher, Sonny and Cher, all of them had shows. And so it wasn't now, you know, if you're not from that era, you're like, what the hell was this? But it was such a, it was only supposed to be for like a half hour, but it kept getting longer and longer and longer because it, People were like, oh, we'll just, the studios were like, this is great. Do more of that. Well, and, I'm, and the network too. Like, this is a cultural yeah, phenomenon. But we, can, you can't we can pack buy, a night with Star Wars. Right. The only thing that's from the Star Wars holiday special that's on official Star Wars uh, document, uh, video is the Boba Fett cartoon. And that ended up on, I can't remember which release of Blu-ray of the original holidays, or original uh, movies, but I think... It was in the bonus added material. We had it on StarWars.com forever, but it's not there anymore. So I don't know where it is now, but um, maybe it's on Disney Plus. I don't know. I never checked. I to think see it if is. The, yes, it is. Is on it Disney now? Plus. Okay. Yep. So, yeah. So I don't think the holiday special will get on Disney Plus, but I'm glad that the Boba Fett cartoon did. I mean, did, do you think was... you would ever see a day when there'd be... You know life, what? I life never, day robes being sold at a theme I park. I never, I never thought that when they started, because life, you have to remember life day, even though it was a holiday special thing, it was something that the fans kept alive. It was never a Lucasfilm official thing. I was always in marketing meetings going, Hey, can we, can we make it official? Like, can we make the fans feel like we are listening and this is important to us? And everyone was a bit too squeamish about doing that because it was still attached to the holiday special. So I did stuff online for StarWars.com over and over and over and in the kids section as well, uh, promoting it as Life Day. And I did stuff on social media during Life Day and people would show screen grabs of their, of their TV, you know, photos of their TV watching the holiday special and I would retweet it and stuff like that. So there were like little subversive things I was kind of doing while I was still at Lucasfilm, but but as far as you, uh, you know, know what, nobody asked George. No one went up and say, hey, George. Can I think we... everyone was afraid to. You know, I, I remember, I can't remember if it was like at Seth Green's wedding or something. I remember it was some event that I was, that he was right there. And I would always get, I would always, stand, I would always get trapped with George in weird time, like moments. And you're not, and the, I think in the employee handbook, it said never approach George. Like let, you can answer a question if he asks you a question, but you don't, you're not supposed to like, you know, make a beeline for him. And there, for the longest time, no fans were allowed to be hired. Uh, if you were found out to be like a super fan, they wouldn't hire you. So I, that's obviously not the case anymore, but I remember that being a thing because they just wanted probably to protect him. So it didn't turn into that robot chicken stuck in an elevator with George Lucas sketch. That, I mean, but he uh, did save did, George. <laughs> which by the way, happened to me a few times. And I remember we didn't get stuck in an elevator, but I remember I wished him happy birthday once. I think the only time I ever really uh, talked to him one-on-one, we never talked Star Wars. In fact, we talked about cowboy boots because he got the same, he had the same cowboy boot maker that my dad has. My dad's a cowboy. So 
that and he had the same uh we just talked about westerns i don't even talk about we don't we never talk about star wars and not really unless it was a meeting i was asked to be in or something but did he initiate the conversation that he's like i kind of you know he's very quiet it's got to be weird is he quiet just because he's like no one's talking to me no no, i don't think it's that you know he's he's a big deal uh but also he's very quiet and he has a very dry british sense of humor so i think um you know when he's in meetings and if he said something but like i was i remember a press junket i was at where he i think he was bored at the press junket or something and i can't remember it was either rick mccallum or one of the publicity people publicity people were like uh george is getting bored and i'm like oh i'll liven things up and i was you know put in the press junket as a starwars.com editor so i was sitting in between the guy from entertainment weekly and someone from like the washington post or whatever and the way the press junkets work it's different tables and the actors will go to dif- different tables and answer questions and then right. the director and the producer will as well and george came to our table and I think at the time, you know, this is an era where everyone had digital recorders, like the, you know, the Twin Peaks recorder, but it's digital instead of a little cassette. Yeah, we, we but, really uh, advanced had, to that point. Yeah, but I had zero budget. They wouldn't give me any money for that ever. So I brought my own recorder, which was a Hello Kitty recorder. <laughs> Those are the shape of a cat head with a real tape, not even a mini tape. Like it was just like a kid's tape recorder. That's all I had. And um, I wasn't going to buy something brand new and not get paid back for it. So everyone puts their recorders in front of whoever's going to talk and they just push play and then they sit back down and then everyone gets a turn. You say your name, your, where you're working, like what, what newspaper or magazine you're working for and your, and your question, just like you would at like a, a presidential press conference or something. And, uh, it got, you know, everyone did their thing and they're asking all the same boring questions everyone always asks. So no one's asking anything really bizarre or weird until it gets to me. And George knows I work for him and George knows I work for starwars.com. And so it gets to me. And also I've been saying I'm Bonnie from starwars.com with everybody else that came through. He's, it gets to me and I'm like, I'm Bonnie from Cat Fancy Magazine. And my question is, and I'm always like, Cat Fancy is like, he pointed at the Hello Kitty recorder. I'm like, yeah, that's me. I was like, uh, why, why aren't there uh, more, you know, cats in Star Wars? Is that something that like, do you, what, what's your thoughts on cats and Star Wars or, or wildlife? And he was, I got the impression he was so excited to answer something different for a change. And he went off on a very long answer about, uh, you know, real world animals and how they inspired different characters, looks and sounds. And uh, it was a great answer. And then, you know, he was more, a little more energized and got up and went to the next table. And I did my part, took one for the team. But it was just so funny, the looks on all the other reporters' faces, because they're like, well, what the, what just happened here? I'm like, eh, that's, <laughs> he, that's what you get. I mean, and I was always for the doing rest of the weird, day. well, see, I was see, always but doing I, But also, stuff. having an archive of stuff, you know, in, in drawers and scrolled away from all the people that I've talked to, where is that tape of him giving the answer to you from Cat I still Cat have Cat. it. It's on a Memorex cassette tape so in my we mixed... need to digitize that. I know. You need I know. to release the You know what? Fancy. In every... Sol- I started a section on StarWars.com, which doesn't exist anymore, called Star Wars Rocks. And this is during the prequels. So, you know, I, w- I wanted to... Uh, I don't want to call it the prequel apology tour because I like the prequels. But at that time, there were a lot of major, you know, hardcore original trilogy fans that were pissed. So I was like, why don't I just start a section on StarWars.com where I interview celebrities about why they love Star Wars? Because then it's like... We're showing that Star Wars is universal and it's for everyone and blah, blah, blah. So I was interviewing like Jane Weedland from the Go-Go's and, uh, you know, different act J.J. Abrams when he was, you know, at Skywalker Ranch working on uh, Mission Impossible, <laughs> directing Mission Impossible. Like I interviewed him. I interviewed a ton of people, like a lot of rock stars, uh, people from Nine Inch Nails and people from like Tegan and Sarah. But also were they, were they act- usually people who were coming through the ranch to work on things. no. No, nope, I sought them out. In fact, I found Jane Weedlin on a message board. <laughs> I was like, hey, Jane, I know you're in Star Trek, but I noticed that you have a Darth Maul sticker on your guitar. I saw it in Rolling Stone. Would you like to be interviewed? And I remember uh, when we tried to get a hold of Seth, Seth thought we were trying to sue him and he wouldn't pick up the phone, Seth Green, and uh, finally picked up the phone. And that started Seth Green's, uh, you know, getting involved with Lucasfilm and eventually doing uh robot chicken specials but then i'm sure it helped us getting the family guy star wars special and then of course uh detours which has yet to come out and i don't know if that will ever come out so i'm glad that i helped facilitate that um but no it was it was really fun talking to all these celebrities about why they love star wars and i like i talked to nick rhodes uh from duran duran 
uh, the keyboardist. Uh, and he you talked have all, about all these. Ta- were they all taped? Oh yeah, that's why my point. I have them all taped still. I taped them all. What are you, all of them? Buddy, they are, are on doing? cassette tape. They are on cassette tape. So what? I have them all. So why are these not digitized yet? I mean, again, a lot of the interviews are all on my live journal because I was like, mm, that's too cool to just have on StarWars.com. I wish I I had been smarter to put everything on live journal, but I think at the time. We just wanted to drive traffic to StarWars.com as much right. as possible. It was before social media was big. Um, now, you know, studios have different ways that they promote stuff. I don't think Disney would ever let me do half the things I did at Lucasfilm. But, you know, I was a big fan of community building. I cared about the social part of social media. And fans are really important to me. And I respected them. And I wanted to profile them. So I was constantly finding ways to profile members of different garrisons. We did a, you know, get to know your garrison section on starwars.com where I'd interview people from different 501st garrisons. I'd interview the R2 builders. I interviewed the, you know, the, um, uh, rebel legion. Um, I was there for the parade when we did the big parade in Pasadena for the, you know, the, the giant one where George was the grand marshal and we had stormtroopers from all different countries come and march in unison. And we had two big floats and we had an amazing marching band from a Southern that college. That was amazing right before the, yeah. And that was a big, was, right? I got to be around and, and be a fly on the wall, but also be actively reporting and actively part of everything that I, that really mattered before the Disney takeover. So I was very excited that I got to be there for that and be part of that. But for me, it was the fans. So anytime I would go to conventions, I I went through boxes of business cards like crazy because I would give them to fans and say, you know, email me here and I'll send you something cool. Or if there's a little kid that did a, I used to do Wookiee roar competitions at Comic-Con with a bullhorn and a microphone. And we would do that and they get t-shirts. Um, and then when I started doing book signings for my star Wars books, I always made sure I had freebies like patches or stickers or little vinyl buttons or enamel buttons to give to, to the fans because without them, Star Wars would not have survived um, at all. And I think oh, that's I mean, important to remember. Particularly in that when you talk about how very real that backlash was. Yeah. After, it was very real. After the prequels. Like I had, I had people yelling at me at the booth about Jar Jar. And I was like, first of all, there are people that like Jar Jar. In fact, there are many little children that love Jar Jar. And whenever time I would do a panel or I would be at a, you know, a Star Wars craft workshop or a drawing tutorial that I was in charge of at Lucasfilm or at a, any of the conventions, including San Diego and Celebration, I always did like a little, little poll at the beginning. And I'd be like, okay, how many people love these movies or these characters? And people would raise their hands just like you would think. But then it started to be a lot more people were raising their hands about loving Jar Jar and loving Darth Maul and loving, you know, these characters, uh, Padme, you know, characters that were in the prequels. And then it started shifting to Clone Wars because Clone Wars had come out. Now people are really into Clone Wars. So it just every generation has their favorites unless they have overbearing parents that are really into the original trilogy. There's a chance for different decades of fans like different things. But when I was there, it was still very much hardcore fans really loved the original trilogy. We're up a big portion. were upset about the prequels, not being what they wanted the prequels to be. Um, and I was there at the tail end of attack of the clones and then the beginning of, and throughout all of revenge of the Sith and then all of the clone wars. And, you know, it was a, an interesting time to be there. Uh, but also I think we got to do a lot of fun stuff. So I was always though, it, there's room enough for everyone. I was a big proponent of everyone can be a Star Wars fan. There's no right or wrong. Uh, don't be racist. Don't be misogynistic. Don't be homophobic. Don't be a jerk. You know, everyone, this is a huge universe and there's something for everyone and respect everyone, but also, you know, be a good like Jedi master to the new people coming to Star Wars. Like, don't just tell them they can only watch this, let them discover stuff, but like, you know, suggest books and comics and video games too that you like in the star Wars world. And so I was always doing that, but and every you, single time be angry, you can walk away, you know, well, it's not just that. I was to... like, you can be angry. You can have an opinion, but you know, when I was doing social media, this is at the beginning of Twitter, right? So this is the beginning in the middle of Twitter being the most popular. I'm still very proud of the fact that I did a celebrity driven pod race, interactive pod race on Twitter. It was more like a, it was almost like a text only dungeons and dragons kind of thing where I was the GM 
And I was, I got a bunch of celebrities that were Star Wars fans and they're in charge of their own pod. And we would design the, the pod racer so people could see what it looked like ahead of time. And then you follow different people on social media. And then I would be retweeting it on Twitter before there were like limits of how often you could retweet in an hour. And we got it trending during the Super Bowl, which was huge. That's never happened ever. I don't think it's happened since. Um, and it was a big deal because it was the beginning of transmedia meeting using Twitter to tell to storytell. Um, and we did it and we got on all these best practices and best of the year awards and things. And, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do it since. I don't think you can do it now because of AI and the bots and algorithm. But back then it was a free for all. Oh, and and so, everything's so fractured. Now. Yeah. And it was so living. much. Yeah. It was so much fun. And but see, I love doing like hashtag like Wookie Wednesdays. Or I'd be like, hey, show me your favorite Wookiee, you know, collectible like you do, right? Like collectible or your favorite Wookiee craft or your favorite Wookiee art or costume or lunch pail or whatever. And I'll retweet you on Star Wars Twitter, which was a big deal for fans to feel like they were seen by the official Twitter. That was huge. That was huge. So I always did that. I did sit Saturdays for the same reason. We would have like fun trivia things that I would do online and you know, it was just a celebration of the fans. And I think that's for me why social media and message boards and, and, and user blogs, we had fan club blogs as well. Um, and also showcasing fans on starwars.com itself was important for me because I wanted the fans to feel listened to, heard, important, validated, and not just the usual fans, like people of color, you know, the gay community, women, I mean, showcasing women in a way that wasn't too like, oh, Slave Leia, you know what I mean? Like something right. else besides that, right. um, which is nothing wrong with Slave Leia cosplayers. But at the time it was kind of like, that was the only thing getting attention. I'm like, no, no, no. You have female artists and comics. You have people behind the scenes working at Lucasfilm who are very talented women. You have all this like fan groups of women doing really cool stuff. You have stormtroopers who are women. Why, why aren't we not showcasing them? So I was really big on that. And um, I'm glad I was because I feel like that helped fans realize that it's for everyone. I don't know what the status is now because I think it's just a different beast now. Social media yeah. is a different world now for Star Wars yeah. and for Star Wars fans. But I mean, for me, I always that. gravitate towards, you know, podcasters like you and fans that are making stuff and cosplayers that are doing cool stuff and kids that are doing stuff. I mean, when also when I was there, we had the fan film awards, which doesn't exist anymore. And we allowed fans to make Star Wars films. And then I went through them all, watched them all, and then picked five for George to look at. And he picked the one he liked. And that won a free trip to Skywalker Ranch. And you could redo your movie at Skywalker Sound. And I think you got to meet with George. Like, it was a big deal. Well, and that's the I sort of thing that, those. you know, you 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 can't have in a, in a corporate environment. Well, I mean, there's, there's something, but there's something about I think where the can. end all decision being george's well at, yeah at that point yeah i mean when george said he was leaving i was like uh oh and you know we didn't know who was gonna buy lucasfilm my bet was on sony not disney i didn't think disney would uh because it's 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 star wars it's huge and it's indiana jones it's huge and it's a huge responsibility not just and also disney fans even though there's a lot of crossover those are very different than than just star wars only fans so um I, I don't know. Like it's it's a different world now. Um I but, but hey, I read like a robot chicken. George can go, I, I I approve of that. Yeah. And I and mean, it and it is allowed to happen because George made the decision ultimately well, I think also, or could make the decision. I mean, yeah. To George to George's credit, you know, he's very much a visionary. He's very much he he's ahead of his time on so many levels, but he also paid attention to what his kids were watching. And you know, Amanda, Katie and Jet, they were all watching this stuff. So I think that also helped him realize, oh, this is cool because this is what my kids are into. And that's the demographic we're trying to reach. So I think he was savvy in that sense as well. And also he, he could... has a he has a killer sense of humor. George has a very good sense of humor. So he understood the humor of Robot Chicken and Family Guy. So um, I think that's, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's part of it too, yeah. but he's not, he's not calling the shots now. It's Disney. Right. Disney is not one person. Is not, yeah. Is Disney is like to... a board of directors with, I think Bob Iger is back, but you well, know, we have also Ka just Kathy. many, many layers of yeah. middle management and, and brand protection. Yeah. Meaning, and meaning I mean, they'll even... air on the side of super caution of where we're not going to mess with this. We're not going to allow this. I like mean, with the Muppets, I... you can see it. I've, I've made this argument. You've seen yeah. numerous times about 
how militant they are about, you know, not showing puppeteers, not showing people performing these things, not wanting mm. to elevate the artistry of the people who execute these things. I, yeah. and it's, and it's, I mean, it's, a, and I don't want to like naysay because I'm sure it's not an easy job. I just know that. No, no, no. But, you but know, it is for me, a, I would like to see, cult, I would like to culture. see, I would like to see Disney and Lucasfilm um, take more risks. I think maybe they might now. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Clone Wars is great. I mean, Clone Wars just keeps getting better. So, you know, Bad Batch was great. Uh, I love the TV shows. You know, John Favreau did a great job. Uh, the movies are decent. I dig, I don't dig all of them 100% like I do others. Like I am just like any other fan of the franchise. There's some of the newer films I like better than the other newer films. And, um, you know, I still think there's a chance to do some really creative, innovative new things. I, I can't wait to see what they do next, but as far as fan relations, I wish they would do more, but I don't know what that's, I don't know what right. their, the, I don't know what their rules are for that. So, well, I know, so particularly that. when it is different, when you don't have a fan club anymore, you don't have outreach like that. Social media is fractured. So it's hard to find where a group is concentrated to manage. Oh that. no, I know where they are. I could <laughs> fix it. They could hire me. I could fix it in a heartbeat, but and, no one's going to hire they, me because. And they should. Uh, no one's gonna hire me because i was in the holiday special documentary probably but yeah anyway <laughs> anyway so was a lot of people they still work <laughs> that's uh, true that's true and also anyway. another thing i've learned about all of this is never say never to anything because anything could happen i so. mean hey i've applied for lots of lucasfilm jobs i don't i don't think i get past whoever is still there that doesn't like me i don't know i don't know what the deal is well, i've yeah. I, I mean, it's sad because a lot of fans will be like, oh, my God, you'd be perfect for this. I'm like, yeah, I know. I applied for it about 20 times and I don't get any callbacks. So I don't know what's going on there. But at also, the same no time, one's, no one's any place forever. Well, yeah. And that's also the universe telling me, hey, you already gave your 30s. You already gave 10 years. You don't need to give another 10. <laughs> you're 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 about at the tail. I'm like past midlife crisis. So like I, I should not be, you know, signing on the dotted line for another 10 years somewhere unless, you know, I know that I can make a difference in a positive way uh and get paid for it and but... you enjoy it yeah i think i i think i would but you know again i have no control over that so right. it's kind of like i don't know now at this point i just want people to hire me in general so i don't i don't know you I and me both we need to <laughs> <laughs> this, i mean and that's why we have fun like this i know thank you thank you for having me on the show i didn't mean to talk so much about lucasfilm i thought we were just gonna talk about toys so we're, uh, we're talking about everything but we, okay. are, gonna, we are gonna start your list <laughs> hopefully See, i did not is... uh i hope i didn't like ugh, hope i didn't like ruin any ndas it's been so long since i signed that contract where i'm like what am i not allowed to talk about but trust me i know where I the body's buried so i haven't I said anything that's, about uh, anything whatsoever i didn't say anything that's uh illegal or cia fbi or all i know is San if PC one thing comes out of this conversation mm -hmm. you, need, you need to dig out that cat fancy i mean i do answer. have a lot of great stories but i'm like keeping them for me you know what i mean like i'm keeping them for my memoirs my books my you, i wanted you, to do you a 30 start writing it well, I wanted to do a 30 Rock show that was of Lucasfilm, right? But I couldn't call it Lucasfilm. So it was going to be called something else. I have a pilot ready to go uh, that's written. That's about what it was like to work at a place like Lucasfilm at the time I was there uh, because so many crazy things happened and so many funny things happened and so many just off the wall things happened at Skywalker, at Big Walk Ranch, and then at Presidio. And I have stories that I have journals and journals and journals that I wrote during that time that are really funny um, and really interesting. And the interactions I had with Carrie Fisher were great. The interactions I had with Mark uh, Hamill were great and Kenny Baker and Peter Mayhew, but also, you know, the people that worked there that who made all this great stuff. So, and Ben Burt and I were always right next to each other on the Lucasfilm yearbook because there's a yearbook that was printed every year of the whole staff, like an actual yearbook. So you could put a face with the name uh, if you had meetings and stuff, but also we had, you know, did a you yearbook. Sign, so it like showed the yearbooks? year. Well, it was fun because it showed what we did that year. So if we had a bunch of promotions for DVDs or for, uh, you know, new movies, new TV shows or comics so is books, there a photo of you, a marriage photo in the yearbook? I think so. Yeah. Cause we had convention. I know this cause I took all the photos. I'm the one who took every single photo for uh, all the conventions and stuff that ended up in the yearbook. So I'm sure there is, I'm sure I like try to sneak one in. Like I did 
in high school, like actual high school, when I was the yearbook editor and I kept just putting my golf friends in everything and so, the jocks did so not I, get primo spots asked, anymore. So I need you. <laughs> I need you when we're done. I don't even it, know where the yearbooks are. I have to find them. Post it on your Instagram department. account when you find it. <laughs> You need to post from the year. Yeah, they're somewhere. I'll find them. I'll find them. They're somewhere. I don't know. I don't know. They're somewhere. So how many, so you have... In the meantime, they're on Flickr. So if you're on Flickr, just do a search. You'll find them. <laughs> if you can find Flickr, you can find them Flickr's on Flickr. is still around. I still have a pro account. It still works. There's is an it app. Still, it's still Yeah, working. there's a Flickr app. There's It's still running. I have all my pictures on there. Photo Bucket is gone, I found out. But uh, Next you'll uh, say the TwitPic is gone. Twitpic's gone. Photo bucket's gone. Uh, Flickr's still around. I don't know what we used before Flickr. Uh, I don't think there was anything, was there? There was there was a uh... Apple Photos AOL. Photo yeah, I think it was something. sharing galleries, right? Yeah, I guess I don't know. I can't remember. Or, or just links far. to your own personal website if you manage I, to have. You one know of what? Those. I had a. I watched. I've been watching a lot of true crime specials, and I watched a documentary that took place in the '90s, and it was all about AOL Messenger. I was like, whoa, that's a that's something I haven't thought about in a while. But yeah, there's... I have a lot of PTSD associated with AOL. <laughs> I had a I had a boss who was who was very oh, no. AOL Messenger online and Aww. was very much twenty four seven. If the I mean, uh... I was trying to think of the first place online that I really talked to Star Wars fans, and I think it was Usenet because I remember Usenet had like rec dot Star Wars dot com or whatever and that's usenet for all of you who don't know what that is just message boards it's just text only message boards before the internet had images it was text only and that's where you would go to find out like to trade comics or to talk about movies or books or uh or pretty spoilers. much anything and everything yeah i belong to alt dot pave dot the dot earth which was just a comedy parody site of people who just wanted to pave the earth and it was in good fun. It was funny, but it was like, there was a bunch of different, so Star Wars was there. And then I started a section on eWorld on Apple, which was the competition of AOL. They had a, star, we had a Star Wars section there. And I mean, I know Friendster, I had Star Wars fans. Then MySpace was big. We had Star Wars fan groups on that. And then Yahoo groups still going strong to this day. I think, I don't know. I'm pretty sure. And I then, think, you yeah. know, Facebook and then Twitter and then everything else that followed. So Star Wars fans are pretty savvy and they'll go where other Star Wars fans are. So, I mean, I think a lot of that stuff probably is getting shared on TikTok now, but it's. Yeah. There's a lot and... of really good cosplayers and creators and, uh, you know, a lot of robot makers, a lot of crafters, but then, you know, there's Star Wars improv and Star Wars, you know, people acting stuff out with their action figures and making stop motion. That's really impressive. And, you know, there's a lot of creativity still out there, and that's but why I like I want to see media. you on TikTok because you're on TikTok. People should go. Follow I am you on, on TikTok. TikTok. I'm still. I was on TikTok when TikTok first started, and then I was like, oh, got a little nervous because of the uh, the malware part, like the non secure part. Yeah. And then I got back on it during COVID because I was just bored. Because then I was just like, I don't care. We're all gonna die anyway. Who cares about privacy? <laughs> so then I was like, I got back on it. And so I've been putting stuff up here and there. I'm, it's it's just for fun for me. I'm not trying to be an influencer or branding or anything. It's no, just but now I want to see you go yeah. through your craft books. And I know I probably you've done numerous craft books and do yeah. like a craft a day or every other day or whatever. Well, I might do that on Twitch. I'm thinking about doing a drunk crafting show uh, or edibles crafting show where I get either on edibles or uh, I drink a bunch of wine and then I try to do complicated crafts. Um, then, and... then you'll never finish it. <laughs> no, I'll finish it. It'll just look like a nightmare at the end. It'll be like nailed it, like that show on. And it's a five-hour marathon stream. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't. I, I mean, I also wanted to do a podcast where I just bring on people that uh like fun stuff, like just a generic podcast of weird stuff. So, you know, people that collect taxidermy, people that collect Star Wars stuff, people that collect, you know, uh, I don't know, handmade volcanoes or something. Like, I wanted to do something that's kind of quirky. Uh, and then I got diagnosed with ADHD recently. So then I kind of wanted to do a podcast with neurodivergent fans of cool stuff, but There's I don't know what I would call more it. ADHD right. than getting diagnosed with ADHD, which distracted you from your original intention of what you should do. I mean, I've been ADHD. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I was recently diagnosed, but I've always had it. And right. I think I was just good at coping mechanisms, but the older you get, and then you throw a plague in the middle of it. Uh, it was like, I could not for the life of me concentrate on anything. So I had like 
books. I have lots of books that are almost done, almost written. I have a lot of craft books that are almost done, almost written. I have comics that are almost done. I have like five screenplays missing the last act, you know, like stuff now like that. I, now um, I think your Twitch crafting show should be called Almost Done. Maybe it will. Maybe it will. <laughs> uh, but I've been like threatening to do a Twitch channel for, I have one. I just haven't put anything up yet. Uh, other than being on other people's Well, Twitch you know, shows. May the 4th is coming up. When was the last time you made I'm something out of your Star be, Wars crafting yeah. book? You know, I'm actually, well, no, the Star Wars craft book is, I didn't think that's, I'm probably not allowed to do any more Star Wars books. I tried and I got, but you shut can down. make the things from them, from it. What was the last time you, yeah, made no, I can make it. stuff from it. I can make stuff from it. I, I did uh, a Jackson uh, diorama for Easter. So I've done, yeah, I do stuff. But um, I, I think, you know, I'll have to think about what I want to do. Uh, the problem with crafts too is that, I kind of want to do the next phase of stuff. I'll probably do some Star Wars stuff and stuff from my other craft book, Crafting with Feminism, which also has a lot of fun crafts in it and sense of humor type crafts as well. But uh, I have some other some other projects in the works. So I might I might do that on my Twitch channel. We'll see. But uh, I have craft tutorials up everywhere online already. You can see them on YouTube if you just do a search. And I was doing them for Disney for a while, but I think they took them all down. I think they were all Muppet related. Um, and I was doing a lot of Muppet crafts for them, uh, paid for, they paid for it. So it was legit. Um, but I do also, I am going to be part of the, uh, may the wish be with you podcast charity event that's happening. So I will probably be doing a craft on one of those maybe, um, on May the 4th. I'll probably, I'll promote it on my socials. I'll send you a link if you want to, uh, send that link out, but it'll be for May the 4th. Yeah, definitely. But, and everyone. Yeah, I always do stuff for May the Fourth. How can I not? Watching needs Even to... though I don't work at Lucasfilm anymore, I'm still a Star Wars fan. Yeah. I will, and I'm still Mrs. R two D two. Like we still have like legit yeah. Star no, Wars legacy you're still, going on. You're still legitimately still part of the yeah. family legally. Yeah, I'm you're just part not of the getting family. that. I'm not getting any Disney money for it. That's the only problem. R <laughs> two never sends anything your way. Oh, droids are not paid. I don't know if you know that they're not. Uh, that there's no pay sound scale. Like Disney. <laughs> they're uh they're droids droids robots don't have rights yet as much as we are afraid of ai i will tell you right now they don't get paid for anything they do so oh. they may be taking all of our jobs but they're not getting paid anything they're just that's why know. they're taking everyone's job i know that's why they're taking everyone's <laughs> job i know i know i wanted them to pick take the crappy jobs and leave the creative jobs for us but now they're doing all the creative jobs and now i'm doing the crappy jobs so now i'm like walking dogs and you know i'm not like cleaning houses yet but See, Am I? Now you have so much more to talk to R2 about. You can relate on so many more levels than you we did have originally. A, uh, we have understanding we don't bring work home. We don't we don't bitch and complain <laughs> about our bosses. You know, it's a pretty Something like... Something tells me R2 does. I understand beeps really well. I can tell when he's upset and it's uh, <laughs> he doesn't bring that stuff home. He knows how stressful life is, so he just keeps it light. He keeps it light. <laughs> well, I, let's let's talk a little bit about your collecting journey. Do you remember what the earliest thing was that you collected? Yes, and I wrote an article about it for CNET. Uh, it was the Chewbacca action figure. I don't have it in front of me, uh, but I do have the giant version of it that Super 7 put out. Uh, so it was this. Just remember this when it was tiny and it was like this big. Uh, now, is this, part of, is this part of your, your five choices? Or is yeah. this an honorable mention? This is part so this, of my five choices. So this Am is your number five. This so is so one is, of them. Now, is that, is that Super 7 or is that the Gentle Giant? Oh, shoot. Jumbo fig? No, Super 7. Super 7 did? Or Gentle uh, Giant. Gentle or Super, Giant. Well, hold on, hold on. What does it say? Hold on. Uh, I think it was gen, that's the Gentle Giant. No, it's Gentle Giant. Giant. You're right, it's Gentle the Giant. Jumbo fig. I The Super 7 one I've got upstairs is the uh, Stormtrooper with the... You know, the, you remember the Godzilla that had the fist that shoots out? Yes. Uh, So Super 7 did one of a Stormtrooper of it shooting out. And it's upstairs. But it's not my top five. I love it, but it's not my top five. So this and is it, the... And it doesn't have the sentimental value. This one has a sentimental value because it's the larger version of the first one I had. And the first one I had, I found uh, on in a park in the dirt. It was a tiny little... Because uh, I didn't have star wars toys growing up we were poor so that i was never getting that stuff so i made friends with kids depending on what their toy collections look like <laughs> so i used children other children for their toy collections if they had them that big millennium falcon thing i was like i need your best friend issues you get his yeah, I, I was, they I was, had to clean I, up 
I would uh, sneak extra cookies into the lunch bag and sit very close to them at lunchtime and go, so tell me about what you got for Christmas. Like that was literally me, like trying to <laughs> figure out which kids had the best. And I wasn't a Barbie person. I was all, the only doll I ever played with was Wonder Woman, uh, the Linda Carter doll, because she looked like me. She had dark hair. I had, I, I'm half Italian, so I grew up with dark hair. So I didn't like, there was no blonde Barbie. No, I couldn't relate to blonde Barbie. <laughs> I, I am not judging Barbie fans, but I could not relate. So I was more of a Star Wars fan. So I, and all my, and all the toys that my brother had were Dukes of Hazard. So like, and chips. So there was no Star Wars at the house. So I had to like <laughs> go and find other kids. The only in kid Wars. in town with the chips collection. Oh no. Chips was big back then. There was a lot of Eric Estrada dolls running around. And also I grew up in Kansas. So that's, that's your demographic. So it's cops <laughs> and cowboys. That's it. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah. So that's how I made friends, but I found this one in the dirt and I, it was like, I was Indiana Jones and it was like the Ark of the Cup. Like I, I was like, this is my Holy Grail. I'm not letting go of it. I found it. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. It was, uh, I, I, I found it at the park. So it was like fair game, took it home, washed it off. And then it became my instant buddy. I put him in my pocket. He was with me at all times. It was the only star Wars thing I owned. So that little Chewbacca, and that was before I even saw the, like, um, I, I think I remember seeing, uh, I think I saw Empire before I saw New Hope because it was a little kid back then. So it was right. like, whatever, we didn't have HBO yet. We didn't have anything yet. So it was like, you go to the drive-in theater and you see what you see. And so I think I saw him kind of in reverse order, but I do remember what seeing what eventually them. made it to network TV. I remember, well, I remember seeing Chewbacca and I was just enthralled with the figure before I knew who it was. And then once I watched, I, of course- he became my favorite besides R2 became my favorite character. So, so this is one of them. This is one of, this is, Hmm. I want to say it's, yeah, I guess it's number five in the group. So have I, you collected Chewbacca since that original Kenner one? Oh yeah. Like, is that oh, also no, I have like, full, constant... I have, I don't have the setup you have, um, but I have lots and I have more Chewbacca back there that I'll show you, but I have uh, lots of different types of Chewbacca collectibles um action figures when i worked at lucasfilm i had a giant bookcase just of r2 stuff so r2 stuff that was legit r2 stuff that was bootleg r2 stuff that fans made and gave me um and so i had a whole heart r2 thing and then for chewbacca for me it was like i always wanted to get chewbacca stuff that made him look weird i didn't want the typical you know i didn't want the typical stuff so i was a, or that made him look like he's made of chocolate because a lot of those action figures they look like melted chocolate bars to be honest so right it's hard to do fur with plastic. I will say that's not easy. So whenever I was at uh, conventions, I would always scour the like the retail section and the vendor section. That was the stuff that no one wanted. So it was more like the bootleg, never in mint condition. I didn't care if it was in mint condition. It didn't matter to me if it was mint condition. So I, because it's for me, it's not for investing. So I was buying stuff that was like probably bootleg. A lot of it was bootleg. A lot of it was homemade. A lot of it was stuff that you're like, I don't, I think this was a factory error, error, but then I was like, I want it. So, and the same with Ewoks. I, I would always buy Ewok stuff where I was like, that face looks weird. I'm going to, that's mine now. I want it. <laughs> like I was just, I never needed anything that everyone else was buying. So I lucked out in the fact that the stuff I was buying was stuff that was like in the dollar bin, like no one wanted it. So, um, or it was just weird. It was just weird. Do you stuff remember which like, Chewbacca you had? Do you have the, the the one that you found? Do you remember if the eyes were the straight ahead ones or the side eye? It was whatever the Ibaka. first one was that came out. So it's the first one that well, came out. Well, they had out. two variants on the eye painting. One was the eyes looking straight on, and the other one was, was side eye Chewbacca. Do I have? Mm, my side, I, don't I don't know if my... Uh... But it's great because he is he's just giving side eye. Uh, mm, let me let me do a quick because I feel like I have a photo of it on Twitter because when I would write these articles for CNET, I would promote the bejesus out of them because we get paid based on clicks. So it was like <laughs> if I didn't, I would, uh, you know, I, do, I wouldn't make rent. So it was a lot. OK, so it was it was this one. OK, so we're looking straight ahead. Is that the straight ahead one? Can you yeah. tell? OK, so it was yes. that one. I'm trying to find a, a picture of the side eye because it, it's just, and I don't know why they had two variants like that. Hmm. Uh, but it is delightful. I mean, 
here's the thing. <laughs> so many action figures were made of those original characters over and over and over. I mean, like when you look at all the different Princess Leia's, and some of them are more manly looking than others. Some of them look the nothing too. like Carrie Fisher <laughs> at all. Some of them look like G.I. Joe with two hair buns. Like it's just, you know what I mean? So it's uh, you know, droids, it's a little different because it's droids, but when it comes to the face, I mean, also C-3PO's face has changed on a few of those as well. Um, I still haven't gotten my Holy Grail item, which is the very creepy looking C-3PO tape dispenser. <laughs> that was that was a little, um, as I'm we know. I'm shocked certain, you still have not gotten There are certain yet. figures that are definitely coveted because they definitely showed things they shouldn't have. Um, I And I will say, I you know, I, I am definitely always on the look... <laughs> I always look for Jar Jar stuff because I got all the like the tongue, the Jar Jar tongue to the toothbrush one and then the spinny lollipop one and then all the stuff that looked like weird sexual things that they did with Jar Jar. Poor Jar Jar. Poor oh. Jar Jar. There was oh. just a lot of stuff that came out for Phantom Menace that you're like, why? Why, why was this? And also, if you ever wanted anyone listening to this, if you can't sneak into Ken's apartment and see his home and see everything there. You can go to Rancho Obi Wan, which is Steve Sansweet's collection, and he has everything, everything, like well, everything, everything. everything, everything. You know, I, I'm really curious. You, know, you maybe, uh, maybe you can connect me with Steve, and maybe Steve would come on Force Five at some point. Oh yeah, to, he probably I would. would. Love to know what his. Oh, he is like. He, uh, but he, but he's if forced to boil it down knowledge. to his five choices, I'm really. I don't curious know if he could. He would pick. I don't honestly. I don't know if he could. But I remember that is what the show is, and he has to. I he's interviewed him once. To. Yeah, I interviewed him once and I think there was, I asked him what, if there was anything he, he had the chance to buy and he didn't and he regrets. And I think it was like, um, I think it was a portrait of Chewbacca that was made out of human hair that a, a barber was making Chewbacca portraits of like hair that was like left oh, on the geez. ground and he would, do, and he didn't, it was something like that or it was like very intricate string art or something um it was something very strange like i had stuff commissioned all the time so i had velvet i have a i have a velvet painting uh above me of uh admiral akbar that's a velvet painting and uh i had that commission the commission for me it's really nice it's right next to my uh painting of of tom Selleck as a general so it's like i've got a lot of how large is the artwork. akbar how much was it, it how, was lar how, how large is it oh it's huge it's like uh so it's it's a room painting it's a oh no yeah it's huge it's a it's centerpiece huge. yeah it's a it's a centerpiece it's on top of my i have uh art displayed on top of my kitchen cabinet so when you walk in it's the first thing you see um but i think i tried to get one commission for steve i might have gotten one commission for him and then i got one of george commission for george i i stood put art up and I used to pull pranks on George's art collection where I would put stuff up that he does not collect, but it made it look like he collected it when we had our, his See, art up in the walls. So you're hanging it over his rock well. Yeah, not that. Not the <laughs> really expensive stuff. It'd always be like a bare wall that I would like sneak something on. But yeah, no, he, um, yeah. So yeah, Sansweet would be great to have because he's he's like the encyclopedia brain of everything that's ever been made. So he he could tell you right away. Uh, what year something was made and when it was made and anything that had recalled for whatever reason but i'm gonna have to get you a side eye chewbacca yeah his collection's amazing and i also love that he has the largest collection of bootleg stuff as well um and international stuff like toilet paper that was legitimately made in mexico and because you know lucasfilm licensed stuff all over the world and there's stuff that could only be made in China as opposed or Japan as opposed to here or only be made in Australia for whatever reason. So he's got everything. Um, and I, I love that he collects all that stuff and it's open to the public. It's a nonprofit organization that he runs. So you can I, I don't know how Rancho has people over now. I think there's a whole process, but you can look them up on Google and find out. But Did he they're, you know, they're in the anything? they're in Northern California. They're a legit museum. You can go visit. It's pretty Did awesome. Did you ever get the stuff back that was stolen? I think he I got a portion was... of it back. I know the guy that stole it. There was someone that stole a bunch of stuff from him and he uh made the news and I think the guy got, you know, obviously got arrested and found, but I don't know how much of that stuff came back to him, which is, you know, unfortunate that someone did that to him because why? Why would you yeah. do that to Sansweet of all people? Yeah. When you, you know, and also who opens up his collection for people to 
to see. Yeah, him. I mean, he's very trustworthy. I'm sure his security is upped since then, but and he doesn't have a ton of people in at the same time. I'm sure it's a lot more, you know, uh, organized or whatnot. But yeah, no, he's his collection's amazing. So you know, if there's a chance, you can see it. But he's done tours. I think he's on a bunch of documentaries, like the How the Toy Made Us documentary. I think that's one of the documentary series where it's. I said on Netflix or Hulu or something where it's like this is the different uh, is that, backgrounds the, of toys. That the, um, I think that's that Netflix as the yeah. So he's on that. So if it's a Star Wars toy documentary, he's and probably, also you know written quite a few indispensable. Yeah, books. yes, he even wrote one about his collection, and some of my stuff is in there because all the stuff I did for the Star Wars craft book I donated to his um, his museum. So everything that I made for the Star Wars craft book is in his museum as well. Um, yeah, so he's got a pretty decent collection of cool stuff. Is it set up as the Bonnie Burton collection within the? No, I, I wish. <laughs> I wish. Maybe if I become super famous anytime soon, he might. But I'm not. I don't think I'm. I don't yeah. think I'm that famous. So I'm well, not that person. You, you but yeah, no. Do you still have the figure that I got you at a San Diego? Do you remember that? What was it of? So uh, we had mentioned Woodstock. Um, yes. Uh, to everyone watching, uh, during one of those little green room sessions, mm -hmm. when, when we're all down entertaining ourselves, it was uh, you and me and uh, our mutual pal Hal Lublin, who's also oh, yeah, Hal. five, and yep. and we had a little uh, challenge going on where uh, I was prompting the two of you. And Wait, you was it Hal? It was Mark there. Um, uh... Mark was around, but it was just. Because we got a big argument about Ewoks. I remember that. You and Hal. So basically, the, the challenge I presented you was an alternating thing where you each would have to mention a Star Wars character. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you you couldn't mention one that was already mentioned. Yeah. And it was who could name the most. So basically, what Oh, yeah. No, I just went through the cantina. Yeah, I just went through the cantina characters. And uh, I remember there was, there was one that he didn't mention. Yeah, uh, but there was also one that we got into a, a side conversation about, and I went out and found you the figure on the convention floor is just a loose figure. Okay, uh, what was it? I have mine here. What was it though? I probably have it. Okay, but what did you give me? I gave did I it... got you a Malakili, a Kenner Malakili. Yeah, it's probably in a giant. Floor. It's it's probably in my giant rubber made tub of action figures. So now you now you know where that Malakili that is in your tub <laughs> of action <laughs> figures came from was San Diego Convention okay. Four. Okay. After our session that drove Hal mad, because I think he lost. He did lose because you don't mm -mm, you don't and, test me. Here's the thing: when I started at Lucasfilm, there was pretty very prominent misogyny within star Wars fans who would come up to me knowing that I worked there that didn't think I should work there. Cause I was a woman and they're like, eh, you don't know anything about star Wars. I'm like, test me. It was always a Voight comp test. It was always like that level of, Oh, I'm going to stump you. Oh, I'm going to stump you. By the way, they never did it with Pablo or Pete. They never did it with any of my male counterparts. It was just me. And it was like, I shouldn't have to do this. And at some point I'm going to slap you the next time you guys ask me to do this, but I will do it now. And that was one of those moments backstage at Woodstock where Hal was like, well, I know more. I'm like, no, you don't. And so we had a little Star Wars. I'm not Hal was nice about it though. Yeah. Hal was nice. Hal was and also nice. I'm the one who ch challenged you both. You were the one that instigated Because I wanted it. to true. see, I just wanted That's to true. see how exhausted, because I- You were, I, you were I, the real, you were the real housewife of I this group. I know how much like, knowledge <laughs> you have. You were the and, Andy Cohen of the situation. And, and I, I know how much ha hubris Hal has about it. <laughs> uh, and, well, and, I don't and ever, just... I don't ever back down from a Star Wars fight. And so I think, uh, but also we had already had a heated discussion about Ewoks eating people. And I was like, yeah, they eat humans. That's why Han Solo was over that pit. He wasn't there to keep warm. He's a hot pocket to them. That's basically, he's a Han pocket. That's basically what it was. <laughs> And I remember we were talking about that. And then we were getting really in deep discussion about the holiday special because I was talking about Akmina and how I was like, oh, she should have this whole backstory. And then, blah, blah, blah. and then, yeah. And then you came along and we're like, oh, I wonder who knows more about Star Wars. I think you were just bored and you were like, I want to, I, mean, I want to pit these two against each other. That's the green room <laughs> conversation. Of uh, that's, that's, I what think you were like, how can room? I make this lively for me? I think that's what you were thinking. And it was. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But there was one character. It was a throwdown. We got the attention of LeVar Burton. I think he stopped by to see what we we're arguing about. <laughs> and then moved along. I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, because come on, no one. There wants were a lot of people that. that circulated past this because it was getting. It was like watching a tennis match. Yeah, I think Ad, Ad, I think it was like Adam Savage and Gray Mahara and probably Weird Al was there and Craig Ferguson was there. I was so the I know Craig there was Ferguson like the circle year. of uh, Neil Gaiman. I think was I don't George know if Martin Neil was, was there. there with Neil. Yeah, so it was like it was a lively discussion that I was clearly well, not. But we were this attention. pocket that was just existing within this challenge. We were in the far corner. We were in the and far people corner could circulate drinking. and and watch this little drama unfolding. But it was also, it was in good nature fun. It was fun. Oh, it was oh, not totally. like, it, it was, was not like someone coming up to Lucasfilm booth saying, you shouldn't be working for Lucasfilm and here's no, why. It, like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't some jerk. It was, <laughs> it was, and that did, that it was did like stop. an exhibition match. It was an yeah, exhibition that, match. And that did stop after a while. Once I proved myself to the fans that I was one of them and that I cared about them, they stopped, which, they which stopped doing that weird never thing. Be done. For anyone in any fandom, the ridiculousness. A, but this of is a, an era. You have to remember, this is way before her universe. This is an era where, oh, if no, you the, were a woman and you knew a lot about Star Wars, you were constantly tested about it because dudes did not think you were legit Star Wars fan. And I don't know why. That's why Team Unicorn came out about that because they were like, oh, no, no, no. We know all this stuff just like you. That's why we're calling ourselves Team Unicorn because we're unicorns because we, you think we don't exist, but we do. And, you know, I got on so many geek girl panels at that in that era. Uh, now I don't think we need them, but for some reason they still have them and I feel segregated a little bit. But, you know, there's, there's plenty of women who know their Star Wars inside and out. And they shouldn't have to prove themselves. And I think this comes with Star Trek or Doctor Who or any video game or any RPG or, you know what I mean? We're still or, having or any to field, any field. And I've I had to do that in science. I had to do that with like legit regular science with other science journalists. So it's just whatever. I don't care. I'm up for it. Take me on. I know all my stuff. I memorized the entire Halicron. So uh, it's, <laughs> good luck. Don't do it for cash. I will I will bet money and I will win rent if you even go against me. Okay, so I'm having you and Hal back on. We're doing the next <laughs> exhibition match. You know, Hal and I were supposed to do a YouTube show together and then the plague hit. So remind him of that, that I was supposed to do something with him. I've been on stage with him for a few comedy things, but because I do stand up and stuff like that. And, and I haven't. So you have the benefit. I don't. You're in LA. You two could get together and. and we have a brunch. Lunch. Yeah. We have talked about this over blueberry pancakes right before the plague. And then we all disappeared. It was like, it's have, so weird. Have brunch again. Yeah, we will. We will. It's getting back to normal. LA is always crazy anyway. LA is a weird. LA is also a weird town where everyone's like, hey, let's do lunch. And they don't. But I'm the one who does. I'm the Midwesterner through and through that's like. Hey, I actually want to go lunch. Like that wasn't just me saying goodbye. That's not LA French exit thing. I want to actually go to lunch, have coffee, the thing, do the show, do the podcast, do the project. So I'm the one that's like the squeaky wheel that's constantly saying, hey, let's do this. But LA and right after during the plague, it was a mess. And then it's still kind of healing after the writer's strike. And, you know, people are still trying to figure stuff out. So eh, it might happen need to have a residence this is an open house where all your friends just know you know, you hold you have like open house hours for all your friends also, to show up uh, we're doing this you don't live in la this is possible no i'm stuff. glad this we've been supposed to be doing something like this for years bit of chat this to have this little happen a little chit chat little talk I'm talk very happy that we were able to have this happen. Uh, it just be at a Woodstock. Woodstock's been dead for nearly 10 well, years. Well, they kind of shifted it to Joko Cruise. So now it's a cruise ship. Yeah, now it's I just know. Joko Cruise, which I is know, a little more the, expensive. But that's, uh, yeah. And also I've only been on it. I, I was only on it once and it was because I was invited and paid for to be there as a guest. Uh, but I was performing. So I was doing Star Wars craft workshops. Uh, I was doing puppet admiral sackbar puppet craft shops and then i was doing some comedy stuff on the side and then improv -y things and uh, whatever so it was it was really fun i just I'm, i don't make cruise ship salary kind of salary so right. i can't go on it all the time but that it kind of shifted from Woodstock, the big performance at comic-con and yeah. i think it briefly went on tour i think will and and uh it's will on, wheaton adam savage and paul and storm took it on it tour started as a point. tour yeah, it started and then as they a tour. eventually just because they couldn't get their schedules to align. Right. 
and then it was just decided listen we can we know san diego we can all be in yeah san diego, but so then we'll it became it. a tour again but after that it was a tour again and then did it they? was san diego yeah they did a brief tour after that and then in they the just mi- shifted to a cruise ship so they just put on joko cruise it's not the same the, the green room i mean it's fun it's just you know i can't afford it but I'll, it's fun <laughs> i wanted i talked to storm about this right before the pandemic hit like mm. all i wanted to do for san diego I didn't, we, you know, we talked about that one tested Adam party at the club, which yeah. was the absolute worst, <laughs> not because of Adam or, or getting together with folks, or me but... or me being awkward around Guillermo de Toro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I must get out of here. You were, you were, I, yes, you were oh, it was so film. bad. It was so bad. It was uh, so bad. <laughs> is everything that could be the least conducive to enjoying the company of other people as far as the noise the crowd the lack of any seating whatsoever it's a shouting match i mean i think the only people that the only party i look forward to quite honestly after that was bill prady's party but that was like an invite only kind of thing and it was more like adam shared their no uh, that was just bill's party that was one year they did a joint oh that's right yeah that's right they did they did they did uh that was but, where will you know, and i photobombed phil plate trying to get his photo with shatner oh my god <laughs> i know i feel like a lot of times it was just photobomb bingo at a lot of those things oh, uh, without a doubt yeah i i you know and it's a different era like nowadays i just don't know i just don't i i don't know i but don't all, know if but all those I wanted... types of things happen anymore you know what i mean because the comic cons are different everybody that used to throw these well, private Dragon parties Con, you, you never got to dragon con no and, and, i never did how sad and so wanted you to get to dragon con i, I haven't me been too. to dragon con since the uh debacle yes. the controversy yeah i mean i i and i go to other cons i go to drag con which is the drag queen convention so i'm there all the time but uh you, but in dragon LA. Con could still happen i, I mean I it's almost the same thing the pandemic started so <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I go to toy convention. I go to like, uh, like the hipster vinyl toy collection, like the, you know, like the kid robot type stuff. Right. And then I do UFO collections. I go to UFO conventions as long as they're not too expensive. I go to the occult ones, like the Curiosities Expos, and I really love horror film conventions just because horror film fans are. Those are just as near and dear to my heart as Star Wars fans, but it's just a different genre, a different type of fan. And I do more horror stuff now than I do sci-fi stuff. So I, you know, I go to those conventions, but I'm also old and I'm also like curmudgeon. And I'm also like, I don't want to get jostled anymore. I don't want to get like, I don't want to have to like fight for air. Here's (laughs) the idea that I, I, I wanted to do. I wanted Mm -hmm. to just have a salon. Okay. And the idea that here's just a lounge that anyone could drop in at. All of uh-huh. our, the, you know, the same green room circle, all of our friends just could have a gathering place. If you want to drop in, hang out, meet up with someone, a nice quiet space that yeah. was. That, it's like the, it's like the uh, VidCon green room. Yeah. It's just, it just had any green room, a to be honest, any green room. room that, that yeah. was open to all our friends at this yeah. place. That's what we call the green room, Ken. It yeah. was just green rooms. Like I, every want, I want to have a green, a green room, room that was not attached to one night at Woodstock. It was basically no, I mean, just all the a conventions. green room for the weekend. Yes. All the conventions have green rooms. That's how I used to hang out <laughs> all the time. Is the, in green so rooms. this would be the dedicated green room. For... We call them hideout rooms. We call them um, <laughs> hydration hideout yeah. rooms. Or, or whichever member of the group would give up their hotel room to be the gathering hotel room. Yeah, so at Dragon Con, it was like the executive lounge at the Hilton was where we'd all gather. Yeah, I mean, night. I will say, you know, the the fun things at these conventions aren't always the conventions. It's sometimes it's just the either the pop up experiences that happen outside or uh, not the not the celebrity infested parties. Because honestly, I didn't like those. I I I was at Lucasfilm celebrity infested parties for years. Like I was at that one every single year, and yeah, it was fun and it was like prestigious and cool and whatever, but. Uh, what I liked is hanging out in the bar at the hotel. So it'd be either a Hilton Marriott, uh, not so much Omni, not so much. Well, yeah, Omni had a pretty good hangout area, but it was mostly Marriott. It was like the Marriott or the Hilton, right? Um, yeah. Those bars, that's where comic book writers and artists would hang out. That's where um, professionals would hang out. That's where the fans would hang out. 
and it was a good group and it was always loud as hell, but it was so much fun because you could talk to so many different types of people in the industry, but also your friends were there because it's everyone who couldn't get into like the celebrity parties right. or well, because back then it wasn't a big, there weren't celebrity parties. Th that's a thing that started. I mean, I remember when entertainment weekly started their Saturday night party, which was a huge ass deal. I got in those only because my old boss was the head of entertainment weekly. So that's the only reason I got into those, but I didn't like seek them out. Like I went to the geek and sundry party because I knew because Felicia was in charge, there would be a good DJ and it would be dance, 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 dance. And everyone would come to it. So you would see like Nathan Fillion and JJ Abrams and, or not JJ, Joss Whedon and a bunch of other people. I mean, I shouldn't say Joss now because, but you know, the people that weren't problematic would show up and you would also just uh, be around other people that like did shows behind the scenes for geek and sundry and nerdist but also just fans right so we had the best time at that party because it's a dance party and that's the one i always like going to and then other parties like the sci-fi pa party and the warner brothers and all the those were nice but those were but more those like industry every parties. well they're industry parties but people went to be seen they weren't right. fun they weren't like, you know what I mean? There's a lot of posturing. It wasn't, and also it was a lot of celebrity hunting. And let me tell you, friend, I'm friends with a lot of celebrities. They don't like to be hunted. They don't like to be on display. They like to just let their hair down. Right. And the Geek and Sundry party, they got to let their hair down. So I think that's what I liked. But again, I don't, I'm going to Comic-Con San Diego for the first time in years this year. And I don't know what to expect. I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know if I can handle more than one day. I San might be Diego. coming back on the Hogwarts train because I don't think I can do three days, four days straight. I, I mean, don't. What I learned at San Diego, where because I spent so many years there, hmm. where you would play the game of chasing down each other. Of yeah. Like, I'll be here at this time, but tag. I'll only be there for yeah. 15 minutes. That's but the only way I could get here. people to find me was signings. But, so I knew if I was doing a book signing, I would see everyone. So my or... solution to it was I, the restaurant in the Marriott. It's like, yeah, I'm just gonna be here. Oh, okay. If you want to find me? Yeah, there you go. Here I am. I have a yeah. table. If you want to swing by and say hello, yeah, I'm here. And that yeah. I found was the best way. And then it would just be people would cycle in, and I'd be getting you know work done or or going yeah. when I had to. But any other time, I was like, you know what? That's where I'm at. If you want to find me, that is where I will be. Yeah, I would, um, if I would overheat, I would go where I would follow the goth kids because that's what you really should do if you're overheating, go where the goth kids are. Or you follow where the five of first are because they're in full armor. So I would always hang out at the five of first booth, which was always upstairs and to the back that was air conditioned. And they also had no line for concessions up there. So I was always hanging out with the five of first uh, if I was hiding from the masses or I just wanted to relax somewhere. And then um, if I had a book signing, I just said, go just come to my book signing. And that's a, most of the times I would find my friends during their signings. Cause I knew they would be stationary. I knew they right. wouldn't be running around, but half the fun of Comic-Con is where is everybody? And you're just trying to find everybody all the time, right. or you try to find the booth that you feel the most comfortable hanging out in. So I was at the Hallmark booth all the time. Cause Christine is a friend of mine and they had really cushy carpet. That was really good for your feet. So like, to me, it was like a spa. Hey, those were always the, the, the plushest of. Yeah. So, and they were always right next to Lucas. Whatever booth, booth, so I, I wasn't carpeting. too far far then I wasn't too far away so if someone from work needed to get a hold of me I'm right there but yeah it's like but again I I, I, but I that was the great thing about Woodstock was that you got at the beginning of the convention yeah, pretty much there. out of the way of like yeah. I saw everybody I saw everybody if yeah. I don't see you again this weekend I got to catch up with you yeah here. and also I would be put on every single freaking panel because I'd say yes to everything um and I didn't realize, I thought it was because I was cool, but I found out later, no, it's because you worked at Lucasfilm. And if it said that a Lucasfilm person was on a panel, the panel automatically got approved. So that's why I was on like 15, 20 panels for Comic-Con thinking, oh, people, this is just, I mean, I'm sure maybe it was a combo of maybe I was entertaining because also I was a pretty good moderator too, because I kept things going and keep things light. But I don't, I'm not that, I don't do that anymore. Like I'm, I get on a panels occasionally. I do signings most of the time. I'm not working for a major company that has me there as an employee. So conventions are a different beast for me now. Now it's just for fun. Now I right. just go to support my friends if they've got stuff going on or I'll be a con wife to one of my friends who is husband or wife is, you know, full time having to sign and they're bored out of their gourd and they just want someone to hang out with or I'm there of my own free will just hanging. 
And, uh, but lately I haven't done that a lot. So when I went to WonderCon, I'm like, I have no stam stamina for this. Like, I don't, I don't know how many, I don't know how many power bars and Red Bulls I need to drink to get back to what I was like before. <laughs> <laughs> But I also don't want to have like a heart attack. I, th I think we also have to get a time machine for us to. I think I need like a scooter <laughs> or something or I don't, yeah, I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I'm supposed to go San Diego Comic Con, but we'll see. But well, you have to let me know. I haven't been there since. <laughs> okay, so how? So I I did this wrong. I showed one of the toys. How do you want to do this with the? So toys? we're gonna go. So that was your number five. So we're counting down. So for the I rest of these. Think about ranking because we're going to build to what your number one is. And there's five, right? So yes. One, so we have. So what's your number four choice? Okay. So my number four choice, I have to walk across my living room to take it from my skeleton. It is the job of the hut. Though I don't know if this is job or stinky. It might be stinky. It came out during the Clone Wars movie, and it's the marshmallow. What are they called? Marshmallows? Marshmallow? Marshmallows? Pillow? Right. Well, they mash. I think they're mash. Aren't they marshmallows? But it's stinky. But here's the fun thing. So not only do I have the adult version, I got a small one for one of my Blythe dolls because I collect <laughs> I collect dolls from the 1970s that are super creepy that are like worth a ton now. This is my retirement fund. Is this doll? So like, so like the Blythe doll. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like their eyes. They're their eyes like change direction when you yeah they, they have, have like a little pull and yeah. then they the right that's <laughs> not haunted at all nope not haunted at all but what's why i love that not only yeah. do they move they change color yeah and this isn't original from the 70s this is our 60s it's not well not one of those re reissues but anyway there's a little tiny one that i got <laughs> that she holds on to i feel like this might be a cry for help is this going to be an exhibit <laughs> a and some murder trial later on um, so anyway, so I have a big one and then I have a little tiny one. So I, they're together. I'll just, that's, that's number four. That's the fourth one. Yeah. That must be st stinky, right? Doesn't he have like a little drool thing coming out the side of his mouth? Yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's from the Clone Wars movie, right? The first one. I don't even know. Does the tag say, I feel like the tag should say, but it might not. Uh, no, it doesn't say. It just says Star Wars. It's kind of hard to do a Google search just for stinky pillow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Do an image search. Yeah, so anyway, stinky. So that's four. But I like him because he came with a miniature version for my dolls. And I used to have this, um, my taxidermy raccoon used to be holding on to this one. So those are the rounds in my apartment. Uh, so that's four. Uh, three is... Yeah, now you're, now you're ranking, so... You yeah, go I know. Tier one. So this is not official. It's a flat Bonnie bootleg of Chewbacca. Is it Chewbacca or is it an Ewok? That looks like Ewok. A wicked, it's Ewok. Right? It's Ewok. So it's a flat Bonnie. Flat Bonnie is a um, toy designer who I love, and she does different tributes to things. And this is an Ewok flat Bonnie that I got at one of the comic cons, I think. Or maybe I purchased it directly from her website. So I was notorious for buying and wearing bootleg things all the time in the office. I was not allowed to. I used to get in trouble a lot. <laughs> you remember when they would do like Woot shirt or the shirts like only around for 24 hours. So it was impossible to send them cease and desist because the right. design would change every. So I bought all of those. So like R. Steven <laughs> stuff uh, with R2 and then um, all of them. I bought all of them. And so it was just you and Steve Sansweet buying up all of this stuff. Well, my excuse was, and I had a legit reason. I said, look, these guys are great artists. We, I'm going to buy their stuff to support them so they still exist. But here's the thing. And I was telling our legal department constantly, please stop sending cease and desist to like these guys that are just like making a few shirts here and there. They're not like mass produced. It isn't China. So just the whole, cool your jets. But they didn't quite understand. And I get it. That's their job, the, the whole thing. And I'm sure it's even worse now with Disney. But what my, and those pre-Etsy, like it was be before all of that. And I was just like, look, these are cute little toys and tributes and things and whatever. And also it's underground toy culture, which was big back then. It was, you know, on Juxtapose Magazine and High Fructose. And it's like a huge, and Nathan Hamill himself, Mark's son, is a toy designer that does this stuff too. So 
my thing was I'm going to buy this stuff, contact the artist and then see somehow, some way I can get them into the fold properly. So I would always do uh, how to draw different character, character tutorials on starwars.com. And I was like, I'd love to have different styles like manga style. Yeah. That's where the book. <laughs> so when I did that, you know, all the, I, and I used to do drawing tutorials at all the conventions and I, you know, have one of our artists, whether it was Katie Cook or Tom Hodges or Matt Bush or any of them, you know, come along and do a drawing tutorial and I'd kind of MC it while they're drawing. And, um, you know, so many kids, so many fans, so many parents were like, can this be a real book? Cause I was having them on starwars.com as printouts. So you could print it out. Cause I was big on non-digital stuff that kids can do. So crafts and drawing. So even though it was on starwars.com, you could print it out and make it right. right? Well, because, the computer. Because iPads weren't a thing that sort of interact. Yeah. But also I, I was a kid that grew up with crafting and right. I still think that's important and not just video games. So, and video activities. So that's where uh draw uh, Clone Wars book came out of um, Grant Gould did the art on that. And I did, I wrote it and that was from Klutz books, which I think now is scholastic. And the first one was this one. You can draw Star Wars. And that was done. I wrote it, but um, Matt Bush and Tom Hodges were the artists on it. But it was also kind of funny because there was, you know, this is definitely much more advanced. The Klutz book is definitely for kids. But then you would do like things like, you know, this to this to that, which they're missing some <laughs> steps there. Like, I think the worst one was. No, no, the, it's clearly just three steps. I mean, and the worst one, I think, was the Death Star. Because it was just like a circle. And then some things, and then the end. And it was just like, wait, wait, what? And then it just ends with add detail. So this came first, <laughs> and this is from DK Publishing. And then this came along, and this was much easier for kids. So And uh, came with the tools to do it. Yeah, it came with uh it came with um well pencils and a sharpener and yeah, yeah it was really cool. Yeah. Um, and both of these things you can still find on eBay and used bookstores. And then the craft book, it took five years of basically me nagging and whining and because when I worked at Lucasfilm um, you were not allowed to work at Lucasfilm and write books uh, the only people that were allowed to do that at the time were Steve Sansweet and Jonathan Rensler and Jonathan Rensler was in charge of publishing and Steve was just Steve um, when I got there and when Pete Vilmer got there Pete wrote a poster book with Steve but he got it because Steve was the co-author so that's why pete got a pass but then i was like no 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 i want to write star wars books for these drawing books and for the craft books i've already proven i had to prove there was a market i had to prove that people were interested i had to prove that people would buy it i had to have letters upon letters upon letters upon letters from fans and and parents saying they would buy it before publishing would even look at my pitch and then i had to prove that i had to be the one that wrote it and then i it was a lot it was a lot so with the star wars craft book a lot of these were, you know, some of them are crafts that, you know, made it onto uh, the Star Wars craft site. Like I think the Chewbacca tissue box holder, um, which is that was influenced by the original ones from the 1940s that I collect, which are the doll head ones. And I was like, let's do a Chewbacca one. But then I did a, a Jabba the Hutt body pillow that there's many pictures on my Instagram of my dog passed out on that. And you know, it was like fun little, fun little crafts that I thought, you know, fans what, would like to make. What was and, the book? Uh, the book was published, I want to say 2009, maybe? 2011. So it's 2011. So, I thought, so this is here's my this washcloth is... wampa. By the way, this washcloth wampa, I made that. Uh, that idea came out of a craft I was supposed to do, and I, for, I forgot to get the supplies. So I took all the hotel washcloths at the hotel i was staying at, Com at san diego comic-con and we made this and i think the brown was like somebody's shirt or something but i had to do like a quick craft tutorial and i i had forgotten the supplies but like we did uh the first clone wars craft which is the tuca doll um see i contend you know, that a lot of what you did with that book that's from the star wars holiday special is this chewbacca i'm, I'm sorry this uh bantha I that bantha take, was lumpy's bantha from the holiday special i contend that a lot of what you did with that book is what inspired a lot of what think geek went on to do oh don't even get me started first of all toaster was my idea that toaster the darth vader toaster 
The thing that pissed me off the most is the thing that I had pitched to marketing every single freaking year that I wanted us to give out tins of mints and have them called mintichlorians. And everyone made fun of me and everyone said, no, that's not do that. And I'm like, have you ever worked a booth? Have you ever been to Comic-Con? If we had mints, do you know how many people would thank us that we were actually actively giving mints to people that never brushed their teeth when they went to Comic-Con? This is something that we need. If I could do Axe body spray that smelled like Jedi, I would have proposed it. But instead I said mintichlorians, yeah, like mintichlorians. It, it, mintichlorians, mintichlorians, it'll, uh, and no one would do it. And then the year I was pushed off the Death Star, they did it. And it was Think Geek, and Think Geek did it. And Think Geek also did a few of the things in my craft book became actual products. Um, okay. Well, like I they, mean, they did the yay. Jabba body pillow, didn't they? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? They did the job of body pillow, didn't they? Well, yeah, they did the job of body. Yeah, that was mine. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff that ended up being on thinking were directly from this craft book. And even though I don't see residual checks from that, I'm glad that I had some sort of like, I'm glad that something I did turned into something everyone could buy. I think that's great. And it's you just... were right. There was a market for it. Here's the thing I learned the hard way. If you want anything done at a company and no one's listening to you, you really should do it in a way or pitch it in a way that, that whoever can get things greenlit they think it's their idea and just let them have it and don't go on podcasts like this and then say it's your idea <laughs> <laughs> because that's how things get done. And, um, you know, that live and learn. That's fine. It's fine. I, you know, I, I feel bad because think Geek doesn't even exist anymore. And it's sad because that was a company that I, I loved buying stuff from and I love their April fools pranks because to this day, I still wish there had been a Mad Max Furiosa car for little girls to drive around like you know the 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 shining oh yeah well i mean they also Easter. had the didn't they wind up eventually doing the the tauntaun sleeping bag yeah yeah that was not in my craft book though but that, that started out actually, as an april fool's day that was well actually it was a girl who made it it was a fan um a fan girl that uh created crafts on the side i found her on live journal or something and uh, she was a crafter. I mean, I didn't invent crafting. Like there's a lot of Star Wars crafters that were around before and after. And I think she had made it just for fun and think he could seen her do it and then commissioned her to make it for uh, a prank. And then it was so overwhelmingly popular that think he was like, we need to do this. And I remember it was, it was a moment when I was still at Lucasfilm where the marketing and licensing departments were like, we don't know if, you know, this is going to really sell. I'm like, oh no, it'll sell. Like it'll sell. Yeah, it'll really no, sell. Like you yeah. guys need to make this. And I don't think they needed coaxing that much. Like, I think they realized this could be a hot item and it ended up being a hot item. And yeah, it was pretty cool. I'm glad it got made. I have one. I still have mine. I slept in it during COVID. I had, not <laughs> I kept thinking if I die, this is going to be hilarious if someone finds my dead body inside of a Tauntaun sleeping bag as it seems so on brand for me. But yeah, anyway. yeah I'm sure they'd be, they'd be like, oh, you knew it. this is going either way. Yeah. Okay, so the next item is, so I added a mustache. Uh, I do this with a lot of my R2s and a lot of the Chewbacca's. Let's see if I can even open this. So what this is, it's a very large, uh-oh. I haven't opened this since I, okay. It's an activity set container. So it holds pencils. I don't what know if it? you can see that. I've never Colored seen pencils. It. And it's supposed to, I think it opens in the front. I'm really scared of breaking this though. It holds pencils. And then I think it's supposed to, is there a trap door? Maybe where the, okay. the leg comes down. Well, or something turns so on. And, uh, but of course I have not checked to see if it turns on still because batteries, <laughs> battery, but the head open, why is this not, did I not know how to open this? I feel like this is like, this feels like a Hellraiser box. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't open it. Right. I know. Right. What if there's something, <laughs> there's again, nothing dead in it. I smelled it. There's nothing. Again, perishable. in all the ways that people would have expected you did to I go. Did I booby trap this? I know. It's like, oh boy. Uh, you remember when she opened up that cursed R2? It's, um, oh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if a gin just flew out? It was like, what's your wish? <laughs> um, anyway, this is supposed to open. I don't know why it's not. This is very embarrassing. Does I don't the know head why turn? it's turn? Is it one of those where you have to turn? Maybe the, the mustache is making it so it won't move. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, yeah, that's why. Hold on. I got to undo the. 
Okay. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So this is what happens when you put very adhesive mustaches, costume mustaches on your droid for humorous purposes. Oh, and then stash, stash. there we go. So then you open it and the head has, what? Oh, the head has these stamps. So we have Darth Maul. I don't even know if these still have ink in them. There's Jar Jar. So clearly this is a Phantom Menace R2. I mean, uh, I think you're going to have to test and see if that ink still. This one works, is, right? uh, Pat oh yeah, look at that. Look at that. Look at that ponytail. Look at that rat tail. That's a rat tail Obi-Wan. That's a rat tail Obi-Wan. What's the next one? You want to guess? Yoda. No, Queen of Amidala. Oh. Yoda. This is Phantom Menace. This is Phantom Menace. They, and the they Phantom still Menace stuck Yoda on so many things for Phantom Yeah, Menace. but I mean, this is the new characters they want to show off. So then you have the, in the front, it's pins. So it's weird that they don't have young Anakin then as part of the selection. Yeah, there's no, um, I guess, I mean, I don't I know. I would have thought they would have put, in the marketing push, they would have put young Anakin instead of the Obi-Wan even. Yeah, but, well, maybe, but maybe they wanted it, him to be more of a surprise. Maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Does the I don't work? Know. I wasn't there for Phantom Menace uh, marketing meetings. I was there for the other one. So I don't know what. Let's find out. Let's find out. Uh, I might have to lick it first. I hate doing that, though, because then I don't know how many <laughs> chemicals I'm ingesting. And I'm trying not to die now that I've survived. Uh, again, of else. the ways you could go. I mean, yeah, do you remember well, she, I'm going to go. But she licked a 25-year-old R2-D2 activity oh, yeah, it kit still works. stamp. Still works. I just stamped. You can sort of see his oh, face. Oh, I mean, it works great. Yeah, I mean, that's not dry out at all. No, I guess closing it with a mustache was what I needed. Anyway, um, but I love what I lo I have this one, but I I love old school kid activity centers that are Star Warsy. So like, if you have something that's the Millennium Falcon, but it's got a bunch of stickers in it, or you have something like this where, you know, clearly it's a droid that has containers. So it makes sense that you have something for the stamps, something for colored pencils, something for, you know, uh, pens. Does it have a pencil sharpener in it? Is any of the, the whole I don't, the pencil sharpener? It seems I don't weird think that they it wouldn't. does. Uh, oh, no, but it has a little notepad. So there's, what? yeah, it's a little tiny uh, sketch pad. A sketch pad. And I feel um, I have to find one of these now. Yeah, and I don't even remember where I got it. It's probably, it was probably, if my memory serves, we had a section at Lucasfilm Marketing that was all just stuff um, that we were, that were either samples from licensing or, like, we had a lot of stuff from licensing that never got made. Not stuff that, obviously, Steve Sansweet would grab. Right. But I grabbed a lot of the man manga stuff. Cause Steve wasn't really into that. I don't think he liked it. So I was like, Oh, I'll take it. So I, I had a lot of like manga pillows, pillowcases, uh, bedware stuff, sheets and things. And then, um, blank books and stuff like that. But I always liked an activity kit. And I always like, this is from my growing up as a kid that would get something from the Sears wish catalog or the JC Penney's Christmas catalog every year. I was surprised, surprised. I was big into crafts. So I liked anything that was all inclusive. So like if you had a sewing kit, but it was in the shape of strawberry shortcake, or, you know, if it was in the shape of, it was a loom making kit, but it was in the shape of uh, a Cylon from, you know, uh, the original Battlestar Galactica, or I had a Spock head that was, it opened up to a painting set, like a actual, you know, all the different watercolors, but it was Spock's head. So I was like, you know, stuff like that. So I like that. So, so when I so if you was had doing your that, well, I was working for Star Wars and I was doing all the crafts and the drawing stuff when this came out, uh, this came out during Phantom Menace, but I think we had another one that came out during Clone War. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe it was Revenge of the Sith. I can't remember. But I found this in the archives of stuff that were, we were going to give away anyway. So right. I just grabbed it. So I just grabbed it. But yeah, I love anything that's like storage because I don't know if you can see from my apartment. I have a lot of stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot back there. I, I don't know what that's like. That's just one wall. That's just one wall. I have 23 bookcases in this tiny apartment. I, Bonnie, I can't relate. I mean, right? So because of that, I, I anything with storage possibilities, I'm all down for. So there was one craft that didn't make it in the Star Wars craft book that to this day I'm mad about. It was another Bantha craft. So that's probably why I think they were only allowing me one. 
Um, but it was a Bantha Ottoman. And so it was an Ottoman, like an Ottoman for storage, uh, but it's in the shape of a Bantha. But you could take the the lid off and store your toys in it. And I thought that was cool. But Do you have that was a lot of fake fur to buy for something. That did was you, a lot. Did you make it though? Oh, yeah. I had it for the office. I think I gave it to Steve. Steve probably has it. All right. So the last, did I do all of them? Let's see. I, I think you're, this is your number so the one. The last one. Is this the last one? I think it's your number one. All right. This is the crazy weird ass Chewbacca. <laughs> I don't have all the facts on this one. So this is a Kenner. 19. So it's a 1997 Kenner. That's the tag. Kenner. Right. It's numbered. Made so in China. So this is around. This is the special edition release. It's, it's year. Lucasfilm. It's got a Lucasfilm thingy on it, so I know it's legit. It's not, but does it not look bootlegged? I mean, look, look at that face. That is not what Chewbacca looks like. I mean, he's very, very high. That is not. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> that is not. He is so I have high right now, buddy. Um, he is so high. <laughs> I can't find it because I wanted to find it to show you, but I also have like a janky looking Ewok. You know what he, uh, that, you know he reminds me of the animated was it on Thundar the Barbarian had the Ukla? Yeah. He looks like the Ukla, the Ukla from Thundar more than He looks Chewbacca. like that. He also looks like uh, a brown version of the uh the you remember the Rudolph Red Nose Reindeer stop motion. The the Bumble? Yeah, so remember the abominable the, Yeah, the the Bumble. Yeah, that yeah, guy. Yeah. Uh, the Yeti, the abominable monster. Yeti he looks also like that. has like Jack Palin's cheeks. I mean, <laughs> also, he did he so have blue happy. eyes? I don't remember Chewbacca having blue eyes. Why does this one have blue eyes? I think he that has... is like some Sinatra blue eye. That's some. Look how. That's some. That is weird, right? That is. That's like. That's an effort. It's also the one where he gets captured because he has a little little. That's a weird thing to add to it. So he's got right? his bowcaster and the chain, and he's Take so the chain happy. Off. Don't enslave my Chewbacca. Why would you keep that on there? Anyway, you know, so he, yeah, special editions. He also special looks editions. a little bit like uh, one of those uh, dehydrated Apple dolls. Oh, you mean the doll that I have in my craft book? That is an Apple doll that's the Emperor Appletine doll? That's clearly, uh, let me see if I can find it. That's also a craft because I have crafts in this craft book that I made in 4-H in the 70s that are very much old, tiny, old, pokey uh, crafts that you would make in it's the Midwest. It's don't know about shrunken apple dolls anymore. Well, I don't know if people, if, if you were into monster making, uh, there was a uh, apple doll. Oh, this is my favorite. One of my favorite crafts is the Chewbacca sock puppet. Look at that. Look how cute he is compared I, to that. I compared so... to the actual licensed... Chewbacca. You, you would get so much. Uh, and the Admiral Sackbar, which I have over there in the corner. I'll bring out Sackbar in a minute. I still have not made. I, st I you know what? Dude, this is I, the easiest I craft always, ever. It's just a bag. I, I, it's, but these, I always intend to make all these things. And look I still have look not at it. made look them. It's just a bag. Pup. It's That's the one I made on the Joko listen, cruise. Listen, I have my, my, that, my bit, love of Akbar. Look, I have my look show that. tune, my performing Akbar here. I have Akbar in my desk. I want to make these. Hey, Akbar. you could be making spoon puppets with wooden spoons that you don't use. That's one thing I always try to do too is crafts with uh, things you could just have. Like if you already have it in your apartment or your house. Uh, I was big on upcycle craft. I'm really trying to find this craft. I don't know why it's taking me so long to find a freaking apple teen. I guess I could just look it up in the in the in the encyclopedia. Nope. In the uh, is there a in this? Also, I was a big fan of bean art. We did the Bosque bean art. That's a lot of beans. <laughs> that's no, also that, a four H. That's a four H. That's a nineteen seventies craft for sure. That's that's the that kind of craft you make. We call that poor kids crafts, where it's basically, uh, oh look, dried beans. What can I possibly make with that? Dried beans and macaroni art. Macaroni art, I think, is a lost art. I don't think enough kids know that that's a thing they they could have done during lockdown. When lockdown happened, I started posting crafts um on cbs from like stuff from the craft books but stuff i was making just for cbs um of fun stuff that they can make also i have a lot of stuff from may the 4th i think seven years worth of may the 4th crafts on on cnet.com uh because i was oh my god the jank you want to see the jankiest looking i do jackal that's a that's supposed to be a halloween pumpkin and that still gives me nightmares because the eyes are a little too human 
Yeah. That's that and that that's and it's weird that the bandolier is sort of looks like a necklace. Well, it's like soap. I think I made it out of soap. A lot of the stuff too. So is... all of this is in the Rancho Obi Wan collection still, right? Oh yeah. And, and some of the crafts too, is, because is the, um... is the bean bosk hanging up? Yeah. Rancho Obi Wan. Yeah. I gave Mary Franklin her own too. Oh, and this was the birdhouse, the Chewbacca birdhouse that I tested out in my own in my own backyard, and birds were going in and out of that. And I had the greatest video up on StarWars.com of birds going in and out of Chewbacca's mouth. Which was freaking hilarious. So this is the apple teen doll. So this is how you make it. You know, you got to shrink an apple. You carve an apple. You carve a face in an apple. Then you shrink it. You hydrate it. And then you add pipe thinner body, which is just horrifying. Look at that. Look how scary that is. <laughs> and then you end up with Emperor Apple Teen, which is that. Which is just the creepiest little. He smells great, though. He smells like apples. So it's like, you know. But that's. Now. Is is the Apple Teen still in the Rancho Obi Wan collection? Probably, unless mice got to it. And then uh, <laughs> this is the uh, uh, at at planter. But just to break this down, because again, poor. Uh, the legs are Pringles cans. The uh, kneecaps are Starbucks uh, lids because we were right next to the Starbucks in the Presidio. That main thing is like a main plant plastic planter body that you can get at any Target or. You can get it cheap anywhere. It's just that plasticky thing that everyone has. The feet are a uh, soup can, the Lipton to go soup, plastic soup. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then the Tourette's are, uh, I think they're either stirrers or straws from Starbucks. And then the head is those strawberry containers that you oh, get strawberries yeah. in, yeah, the, the plastic the, ones. The straining. And yeah. then just covered in duct tape. And that's a planter. That's, this came from my brain, by the way. This, is I, it- you're, you're... The fact that Lucasfilm let me go is how? Why? Why would you let the person who thought this up leave your and company? And could have had more ideas. And, and oh, I always have ideas because so... I never sleep. I'm like that girl that like refinishes her floor in real Ge- the movie Real Genius. I never sleep. So I am always thinking of good craft ideas. So there needs to be a volume two. Especially I've been trying now. to get one made for years, but I think the problem is I think... And I don't know if I'm just being paranoid or not, but I have pitched the book to DK. I've pitched the book to Chronicle. I've pitched the book to everywhere. And I think because I kind of got pushed out and there's people that may or may not like me anymore at the company that decide these things. I think I've been replaced by other girls that are also kind of now known as crafty people and they're fine. There's, Hey, there's room for as many crafters as possible. I, this is not a hunger game situation. There can, there's not Highlander, there can be more than one of us, but I think they prefer to go with those girls instead of me. So I've, I don't know how I can like convince them to like bring me back or, into the fold without just, like just a major do, sacrifice. <laughs> do a, do a, a crowdfunding. No, because... you can't do anything. No, no, no. I'll get shut down for that. You can't do anything Star Wars. No, that's but it's not Star Wars. It's not Palpatine. It's Appleteen. You have pun names. Everyone can identify. Even I know there's limits. Even I know there's limits. And I do not have enough money to go up against a Disney lawyer. So no, I will not be doing any fake. I will not be doing any fake Star Wars craft books because I either (laughs) want to do the real one or not. Real one or not. And then there's other franchises. They can't stop you from doing a, a TikTok account where you're making the crafts and sharing it. And yeah, as long as it's not monetized, I can do it. The minute I monetize it, I get in trouble. So oh. anyone would, anyone would. So yeah, I just, um. but also there's other franchises out there. So, I mean, I could do fallout crafts if I really wanted to, or I don't know. I mean, I would just have to get permission. That's the only problem. If you want to do something within a realm, that's right. a licensed thing. You kind of have to get permission or I just have to bug every single franchise I love. Like I tried to get a Doctor Who craft book made and no one would do it. No one would let me do it. I tried to do a Star Trek one and they ended up doing one without me and took a lot of my my ideas, but that's okay. <laughs> it's like the Adventure Time craft book, same thing. And I was just kind of like, eh, I think I'm going to hold off on pitching things because I don't want right. it to show up in a book and I don't get credit. But also at the same time, I, I can't do a craft book every year. It would kill me because that's a lot of work. It's a lot more work than people think. Um, and I, also I, I do other craft books. I did the crafting with feminism book, which I'm very proud of. And that came out during, uh, Trump's reign, which is funny. Cause my agent was like, oh, this will do great when Hillary's president. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then she was not president. And then I thought, oh, the book's going to tank. And it ended up doing well because 
<laughs> people were wearing things that were wearable crafts like the feminist killjoy beauty sash and hats and things to women's rallies but then also because i had gotten so many one star reviews from trump people people thought it was a making fun of feminism book so then i started to go to trump rallies and sell it there jokes on them because <laughs> it's not a joke book it's a feminist yeah, book. it came out in 2016 didn't it uh it came out yeah it came yeah. out right uh, when he right when he became president basically Towards so the end of the year right yeah it yeah was the holiday, so, it was a holiday release yeah yeah and it, i mean it's through quirk books through penguin random house and it's still available you can still buy it and it still does well it's just funny because people didn't really know what to think of it because it's it's a fun book that uh celebrates uh feminism and feminist history but in a fun way like in a lighthearted way not in a heavy way but also there's fun crafts in there yeah, I mean, the there's also crafts in there that are like not for kids so it's not a kid's book so there's like uh uh i think there's vagina tree ornaments for your christmas tree that look like little glittery vaginas and then uh dolls that i made out of tampons that i actually showed kids how to make at geek girl con uh i had a crafting with feminism feminism panel and i showed them how to make wonder woman bands wristbands but also little mouse puppets from tampon unused unused tampons yeah. uh <laughs> i mean come on it's not that hardcore um but, but yeah the, there, but it the was, book it is was, evergreen i didn't know it was still in print so it is still yeah it's still in print i mean i guess i should i guess i should do my due diligence show you the cover yeah but um yeah no it's a fun book there's like uh ruth bader ginsburg finger puppets there's uh you know uh nope necklaces and like you know fake fake girl scout badges like leg hair don't care kind of thing I'm yeah, trying to it's think just, it's the, just like oh here's your, the tampon here's the tampon dolls but it's like all oh, of your that. craft books it's just fun it's all yeah fun i mean it's funny do. too because like this was such a weird i had a huggable uterus pillow and the mouth you put in a heating pad and you can hug your uterus and it has a heating That's pad also in it, in rancho cramps. obi-wan right now right <laughs> could you imagine <laughs> you would probably be like i didn't ask for this bonnie why or, are you or you just, steve it was in the back of yeah, the cantina the, you just didn't the see it steve this is a glittery vagina tree ornaments. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, there's stuff on here too. That's like, I mean, whatever. Like I just had fun making this book because also it was like, there's no real rules to it. So it was like all different types of crafts. I definitely wanted to have stuff for adults in there, but also stuff that was like, kind of, you could like the, the pizza, uh, lunch holder that says pizza, not patriarchy. <laughs> but that's, I mean, it's but funny that's, because that's, in the book, when the book came out, Portlandia came out. So I was like, oh, this is, this should be in that bookstore. And the yeah, Portlandia, but that's I actually the thing that's sent them a copy. Well, I sent them a, it's a, it's based on a real bookstore in Portland. So I sent them a copy of this book, but you know, it was like, we have like fake uh, Girl Scout badges. And one of them says like hair, don't care. One of them's like zine maker. I don't know. And then there's like, listen here about feminist magazine like feminist movies to watch feminist riot girl bands to listen to zines to get uh, all of that which is funny because now it's making a resurgence that whole era of riot girl is making a resurgence now so i'm hoping to remarket that as like a riot girl craft book but but that's yeah thing. no I, I mean i love doing crafts. on all of the stuff that you've done is there's just a sense of yeah and i do and also and I just do stuff for fun. Like I have deluxe spirograph kits that I went to town on during COVID. Like I have so many spirograph journals and things. And I was like, and again, I don't know if that's a cry for help or not, but I was also just doing also, fun it, stuff. That entire era for all of us was a cry for help. So anything that was done. I mean, that... I was crocheting characters from John Waters films. Like I had a lot that I was doing for self-care that involved crafting um, because I do think crafting is not only just a express an art form, but it is kind of like a meditative thing. If you're knitting or painting or drawing, it's been scientifically proven that it can bring down your stress, bring down your blood pressure. I mean, there's certain crafts that bring up my blood pressure, like origami. I still have not, I'm not of the patience for. Um, but there's other things I love doing, like painting rocks and things. So um, I don't know. I think there's, I, I think there's many craft books left in me. I would love to do another st official Star Wars craft. So write your Senator and Congressman today. <laughs> but I also, uh, also know there's many other, uh, existing franchises out there that would, I would, that don't have craft books that I would love to do craft books for. Um, but also I just like doing fun stuff at home just for the fun of it. Like 
I will say my favorite. I feel like I'm turning, you're seeing my ADHD and it's fullest because I just walk off. I'm like the target lady. Um, literally the target lady. But my favorite will always be Admiral Sackbar. See? Made out of paper bag and felt. This is, I think, oh. version, this is version 10 because I used to take him to celebrity parties at Comic-Con and he would get taken off my hand very quickly and then passed around a party, like just a, I'm not going to say the words, but you know what I mean? Just passed around the party. <laughs> so so here, here's what I, here's what. So many celebrity selfies with this thing. I remember because. Here's my fondest wish right now. <laughs> this is, I, I want to uh, uh, re-experience oh, yeah. something akin to the Wootstock green room. Okay. That we had on, on those times. And okay. it's just all of us sitting around making Admiral Sackbars. I just want, I mean, I want okay. an Admiral Sackbar party. Can we have. Uh -huh. Is that a thing we can all get together and have an Admiral Sackbar? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only problem is, as you know, with a lot of us, getting us, herding us together into one room is very difficult. So how about this? Here's my proposal, because it's so difficult. With you have to and, trick us or something it, to get people in we're, there. We're in disparate places. We we have the, the, the book. What if you were to put together a materials list? And we get oh, you mean like a workshop, like a craft why, workshop? Why don't we? Why don't we just do it all on the live stream? We get a bunch of our friends together, and we are all in our own spaces. Oh yeah, we could do that. And we're all making our Admiral Sackbars and talking and having fun, and we'll have you know a little celebration of Admiral Sackbar and all the stuff that you've done and all these crafts, but also yeah. the fun of all of us hanging out together. Yeah, and we you know do what? That. And maybe we'll inspire people who are watching to make their own Admiral Sackbars along with us. Yeah. And we can all show off our sack bars at the end. I have to say, I'll have to practice that because I was supposed to do that last year on uh, the movie Crypt, which is a horror podcast that Adam Green and um, film, the horror filmmakers, Adam Green and Joe Lynch do. It's a it's like a, a charity for your re rescue Yorkies dog because he has a dog that's Yorkie. And I was supposed to come over to the studio, which is in my neighborhood and make this but i had gotten so i was so caffeinated and it was late at night and i was so excited to be there and it was like this big production and it was a televised telethon and i was supposed to show how to make this craft but it took so long for me to get all the materials on the table and then as soon as i was ready to go they they, they ran out of time so what i was telling all these stories kind of like what i told you today on the podcast but also just fun stories about working at lucasfilm and things like that and it was like, okay, the next time I'm asked to do a craft like this, like you just suggested, I have to make sure I'm like Martha Stewart ready. Like I have to have everything laid out in front of me, all ready to go. And I have to like do some dry so runs on my own, time it out because my ADHD will take over and I will get instantly distracted by a jar of googly eyes. And then three hours later, <laughs> nothing will be made. I have never seen you be distracted by a jar of googly eyes. I mean, the only reason Geek DIY got made the way it got made is heavy editing. And also I was the writer. I didn't, I wasn't the director. I was the writer and the host and the celebrity wrangler and the craft coordinator. And I did all the crafts and everything, but I wasn't the director. And I think having a director is how that, well, I was sort of a director, but like I had actually someone who was like, no, we're cutting, we're cutting right now. You have to okay. stop talking. So then here's my request. This takes, this, this is all on you. Oh God. Then it's never going to get done. I so. know. That's why I'm putting it out there. But here, here, okay. here's the thing. So it, it depends on no one else's schedules, but yours. Oh God. Okay. And this is, this is a time, a timely request in this way. Uh huh. A personal request <laughs> for May the 4th. No, it can't be then. Cause I already have something I'm doing. No, 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 no. This is, this is just on your YouTube uh, or your YouTube on your TikTok, a pre-record, but all it is is just you giving the steps for people to build oh. stack bar. Oh, I could probably do a TikTok of that. Yeah, just a okay. TikTok, an easy thing for people to spread around. Maybe okay. and and maybe people can stitch their sack bars that they've made <laughs> based on your tutorial and share it around. Yeah, they'll hash. They'll have to do a hashtag or something so I can find it. Yeah, Hasht hashtag sack bar. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's his name. But that, that's there. There's my request. I would love for you to put hmm. out because okay, I'll your see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. Celebrated. That, that sounds 
easy-ish enough to do. I think I can do it. You'll just and, have to remind can, me. And you can edit. You can edit all. You can film it as well... the process and then edit the process down. Okay. Okay. Editing. <laughs> Ugh. I hate YouTube editing. That's like the circle, seventh circle of hell is YouTube and TikTok editing. But yes. Yes, I will. I will try to do that for you as a friend. Uh, if it doesn't end up on May the 4th, it might be uh, May the Sith be with you or whatever. What is it? The sixth day? Uh, it's like the May the 5th. Yeah. I think it's May the, the, May the Sith. Sith. Yeah. May the Sith, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll, it'll happen. And if uh, it doesn't happen on that, it'll happen on Life Day, which is in November. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what? We can make any day Admiral Sackbar Day. That's true. We can That's set true. any day. So basically, whatever Maybe it comes out. Maybe it's Sackbar Saturday. We'll just be a Saturday or something. That's fine. We'll figure it out. We'll figure Every it out. Saturday oh, yeah. Saturday yeah. Saturday. But yeah, this is like the easiest. This I will say this is probably aside from the Chewbacca sock puppet, which is also in Steve Sansweet's uh, Rancho Obi-Wan. This one's the easiest because it's just a bag puppet with felt. And it's the most fun to make. And also so when I, I did this craft on the Joko Cruise, and you can look on my Instagram because I have a section called crafts and one of the highlight bubbles you can click on. And I posted a bunch of pictures of people who made their own version. Like everyone has their own version of what it is. So like this is it. But then some people would put on eyelashes. Some people would be googly eyes. Some people had fancier outfits. So like everyone puts their own creative stamp on their puppet. So it's kind of fun to see so all the different variations. I'm not going to, I have, I'm setting it down. I am not going to make. And I've I've wanted to make one for years, and I've never gotten okay. around to it. I will not make one until you release. All right, a tutorial video. No pressure. Um, okay, I, I'll no, it's do. Like, that. Well, it's not pressure. It just means that I won't have a thing that I that I clearly love that you created. Well, I that... mean, I also have the PDF online. I could just send that to you. I mean, no, no. I'm <laughs> now. I'm not going to do it until the world can have you guiding them. Okay. Through, through the through the means that they have easy access to, because everyone's on TikTok now. That's no true. No one reads. I I could do a talk, a ticket, a tickety talk of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do. I'll yeah. Okay. Your TikTok talk. I'll I'll TikTok. I'll yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if I could go to House of Pies and put on a bunny head and do a TikTok, I should be able to do this. So. Yeah. And you have and you have plenty of friends who I'm sure would help. In you theory. <laughs> Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, let's I say I have friends. I know you have plenty of friends. Let's say I have some, a couple. You uh, have yeah, a ton this has of been friends. delightful, by the way. I hope I haven't. Is this like a five hour podcast? I know they're no, usually two is, hours. This, this is, the, they've been far three? longer than this. This is okay. one of the shorter <laughs> ones. But, but one last time, because I, I need to remind everyone of it before it goes. You're, hmm. can, you, can you show your number one choice one more time? Let's see that Chewbacca. This is it, right? Oh, no, 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 that's four. That's the last that's, one. That's, that's the number five. Crazy Eye. Drunk we started Chewbacca. with Chewbacca and we ended this with Chewbacca. This is my favorite. The one that's still got the poor slave Chewbacca. Let's not call him that because that's not good. But uh, I feel what, like he's got a, he's kind we, of got a that's, wild, maybe that's crazy. that's like a club accessory. Maybe he's going yeah, to like Yeah, there you go. Club. Maybe it's like a BDSM situation. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's like, a, you know what? It's no, like no, a we're Betty not... Page. We're not Wookiee shaming anything. Yeah, it's like, yeah, there's no kink shame here. Um, Yeah, so this is the crazy blue eyes, nonetheless. I still, that still cracks me up. He has blue eyes because he doesn't have, I only have blue eyes. Once we're done with this, I'm going to look up what other dolls, because he can't have been the only release that came out. So I got to know. What oh, the no, there's tons. Like. There's there's tons. This is just the one I like the most because I like his size. I like that he's super furry. I look, I like that he's got crazy face. Surely they um, did and he a, stands a, up a on wicket. his own really he's they in one of my bookcases well he stands up really well and you know when i have the other the other chewbacca the first one i showed i always have him standing right next to enid from ghost world like they're going to prom though he's <laughs> remarkably shorter i mean he's still shorter but like that's they hang out together so they have their own they have their own storyline going on uh but that chewbacca that the furry one he has his own shelf and my one of my bookshelves so that's and then everything else is utilitarian because i mean this is on the crap this is in the white section of books um i will not put his mustache back on though so because now and you then know the, that it was it was sealing it the access i had no idea all that stuff was still in there now I'm and gonna still use it. works it still works like so now i'm going to use those those stamps and stuff for like letters so i 
I feel like this has been a very um, productive podcast for me as well, <laughs> because I've discovered things that I've owned for decades that I did not know were in there. You know I'm what? This, they... this is why I do the work I do. Yeah. I'm glad it's useful stuff and not perishable. Could you man manage if it was like Pez or something that was all moldy? That would have been am, the worst. But still, the fact that that ink is not dried out. I'm in shocked at that. That's 25 years. That, that they, they, they dry out so quickly. They dry out so quickly. So I was, I'm shocked as well. That's, I'm that's glad quality that workmanship. Discovered that you can use a Jar Jar stamp on the 25th anniversary coming up of the release of Phantom Menace. So it's what timing to know. Good timing, you're... right? I know. I know. <laughs> and there's a lot of great Jar Jar stuff out there on eBay too. So for those of you that are like, I, oh, I can never find that stuff. Oh, it's out there. I just got a Pez dispenser uh set of of him in the meat market scene with with yeah. gra gra mm -hmm. i got that pez dispenser i mean i keep looking for other gungan stuff so not just jar jar you know the whole the whole setup so i'm always looking for so you got your captain tarples cup yeah all of that and then also <laughs> uh <laughs> also i mean the another holy grail item is the lo i think the lollipop jar jar holder um the toothbrush with the electric toothbrush i have which is horrific i don't even know where it's at but it's hidden it's like annabelle it's like in its own case <laughs> so it doesn't it doesn't come after me in the middle of the night but there's so i mean especially the prequel era there's so many weird collectibles that came out during that time especially phantom menace specifically i would remarkable say remarkable how much stuff came out because they just they're like this is the first star wars film in forever so phantom menace we're putting all our marketing dollars and licensing behind it but so there's just the like weirdest every stuff. Every company, there were so many licenses. So like, many weird there's, things. There's so a, many weird things though. Like just the weirdest. We we're like, really? Soap on a rope? Really? Uh, there's swatches? a book okay. to be written of just every single yeah. Phantom Menace product. Yeah. That came out. And, that time. and and they're still out there. I still go to flea markets and swap meets and garage sales where I see Phantom Menace stuff, and I'm like, okay, I'm taking that because that's. I'm going to re-gift it to someone who wants it because I know that there's fans out there that are always looking for stuff. And, you know, there's certain things that, yeah, that are probably going to be worth a lot. Like Lego always is worth a lot. Uh, Lego never goes out of style, but it's just the weirder things I like. So I like stuff that people are like, why did, why was this made? Those are my favorite collectibles is why the heck was this made? <laughs> <laughs> and I know why it's for me. It's yeah. for me. It's for it's Ken. For it's us. for Steve Sansweet. And it's for like a handful of people who really like that stuff. So yeah. Shout out to Steve Sansweet. <laughs> he was right now going over. And... I know. I'll have to contact him and and let him know you. I'm sure he knows this show exists because how could he not? He's such a major collector and he's so on the I, on his game and he knows everything. I and, need to know what so. his five. I need to know what his number one is of all the stuff he has. I need to know what his. That would be probably his animatronic Cantina band. He has an animatronic most uh, modal nodes band. Maybe. In his barn, like it's a uh, life size and it's amazing. And so, it plays so it's music like the rock of fire music. Yeah. It's like Chuck E. Cheese, but it's, you know, the mobile notes. So it's that and he's got it and it's great and it's amazing. But he what also, is, he, is it, is it just the, the cantina song that's programmed into it? Or does he no, have I like, think it's you know, this other side, drug, side or... noodles songs with like the others, nothing from the clone wars, but like, I think it's not just pop songs. It's like, you know, no, it, I it's, wish. It's no, only, it's not it's only programmed with Huey Lewis and the new It's songs. not like the Tutty Rexpin doll where you could put a Metallica cassette in there and make Tutty Rexpin sing Metallica. It's not like that. It's not like Maybe a, that's what Steve tells people, but yes, it is exactly like, I that. don't. Yeah. And, and I don't anything. know. I know he has the Han and Carbonite, but I don't know if he has the George Lucas and Carbonite because that was made just for by fans that brought it to Celebration Japan is where I saw it. Um, so I don't know. That's the one we had Jar Jar or we had George and Carbonite at Lucasfilm. So we had that at Lucasfilm in the ILM offices, but I don't know what's still there. Also, I don't know what's been moved to L.A. because I know that they moved some stuff to the Disney offices so it'd be interesting i used to give the tours so when i worked at lucasfilm i gave the celebrities tours of ilm and of skywalker and going right by that george and carbonite i cannot tell you how many celebrities have had their selfies taken in front of Maybe that thing george but it's a lot a with him i'm really curious oh yeah no george liked it george thought it was funny talked. so george is taking a picture in front of it i mean if george didn't like it it would not be on display at ilm <laughs> i can tell you that because ilm has everything on display they've ever made not just star wars and indie but like everything everything like star trek movies uh terminator but there must Abibis. have been some personal stuff that just 
George love that in in the sale he must go and I'm keeping that. Well, no, he he so he has his own museum. He's opening up in L.A. Yeah. yeah so but... it'll be and also a lot of that stuff that's on display that's in the archives will probably go over to that museum. So there's probably going to be stuff over there. That I want to believe saves. that the Georgian Carbonite is in his guest bathroom right now. I don't think so, but I don't know. I mean, he also is married now and she probably has like legit adult taste, like an adult woman who probably is like, I don't want this in the bathroom. So I don't think it's that. I don't, or, or I, I don't know. Going, I don't know. Putting the carbonite you in the guest bathroom. I feel like there's probably a separation of church and state and all the star Wars gimmicky things are probably in his office or but something. He's not but a not... star Wars collector. I mean, that's the one thing about creating the things is. Yes. I don't know. It's, you know, it's funny. A lot of people that make this stuff don't collect it and, but they want it. Like I've given stuff. I think I've given stuff to Nathan to give to Mark Hamill and I've given stuff to, uh, I've done stuff with Marvel and I made sure that those people got the stuff that they were directing, uh, whether it's Dr. Strange or, you know, uh, four or whatever. Like I, but it's funny because a lot of the actors don't even get their own action figures of themselves. So when I was at Lucasfilm, I made sure every single actor who had an action figure got their action figure because they didn't always get that, especially if it was side like weird side character or you know someone that's not a main character in Clone Wars. I still made sure they got their action figures because how could you not? That's like such a that's such a big deal when you're an actor that you finally oh, yeah. get to play a character that has a toy. Are you kidding me? I would collect all, something everything as iconic as being a Star yes. Wars toy. Yeah, so I always made sure they got everything that was possible that I could get my hands on for free and send it to them. But who was, do you remember who was the most excited that you sent one to that, that maybe got back to you or. I don't remember. It might've been, it was one of the clone wars. I don't know if it was cat Tabor. Um, maybe, I mean, Ashley pretty much got Ashley Eckstein got a lot of her stuff. Matt Lanter got a lot of his stuff because they were, you know, the main characters, but I feel like it was either Kat or maybe Meredith Salinger or maybe, hmm, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I know that uh, Jamie King also, she got to, I think she was Aura Singh, wasn't she or not? I can't remember what character Jamie King was, but I made sure she got stuff. And then anyone who got any kind of voiceover in something just for fun that was just there. Uh, I think George Takei did a voiceover of a character. I made sure he got his his toy like, but I mean, he's also like, he's in the other realm. He's in the Star Trek realm. So I don't even know how much Star George Takei stuff George Takei owns, you know, like from Star Trek. So were so, you responsible for John Favreau getting a, a pre Vizsla figure? I always made out? sure Favreau got stuff. I mean, <laughs> as long as I was there in an official capacity and didn't have to pay postage, I was making sure everyone got everything um, that I could get my hands on because I thought that was important to make them feel like they're part of the Star Wars family. And when you have your own character, even if it's just for one episode of Clone Wars, that's a big deal. Or even if you're doing a voiceover in one of the video games, that's a big deal. So I did try to make sure that everyone got the swag that had their voice attached to it, uh, if it was an animated thing. If it was the movies, um, I didn't always have direct access to those actors because those guys were pretty big. But I think Daniel Logan, I always made sure, Jake, I always made sure he got stuff. Um, you know, everyone that wanted it got it. I don't think Natalie ever really wanted any of this stuff. I think I, that's just Natalie, though, so I don't know. Um, yeah. But Dave Filoni was always walking by the closet to load up on stuff that came in. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, but here's the thing. Like, he's a, you know, he's a fan, too. And I think that's what made Clone Wars so special is the people that worked on it really loved Clone Wars. And you can tell. You can tell they put their heart and soul into that show. Um, D. Bradley Baker, you know, I made sure that any creature we ever made with any voice that he voiced, he got those. And obviously all the clone characters as well. I made sure he got that stuff. But Tracy Kenobia, who's still at Lucasfilm, I think she still probably does that in my absence. If not, I'm sure she would. But yeah, like a lot of the voice actors, I mean, D. Bradley Baker is amazing because he does so many character voices, yeah, so many creature he has voices. Thousands of action figures. He's there. the thousands, but and he's such a great fan, and he's great with fans. So I made sure he got stuff. But I'm trying to remember who was the most excited. And I can't off offhand. I can't really remember. I can tell you the celebrities that were most excited to get free stuff. Uh, Filoni was, uh, or not Filoni. I'm sorry. D uh, Nathan Fillion was. Uh, I know that. Um, 
the whole cast of Castle I sent stuff to. The whole cast of iZombie I sent stuff to. Because they all said they were Star Wars fans. I'm like, okay. Uh, Jane Whelan from the Go-Go's. She, I constantly sent, sent her stuff that she was excited about. And uh, bands that came through on tour, uh, the Decemberists, I gave them all, they got all lightsabers. And then they had a lightsaber battle on stage I think with Death Cab for Cutie uh, at the Warfield, which was a huge uh, thing. And then I think I gave out T-shirts that had uh, a spray painting and spray painted Vader to a bunch of bands at Coachella. Uh, Kasabian wore them and got like in Rolling Stone magazine with this T-shirt I made. And like I always just made sure that fans of the stuff got it because it was free publicity for us if they were wearing it or playing with it or talking about it. That's just free for us. That's influencer culture before influencer culture. Right. I mean, now it's standard, right, to do that. But back then, it was pretty unheard of to send celebrities Star Wars stuff because I heard them on Conan O'Brien talking about how much they liked about Star Wars. And then as soon as I heard that, I'd be like, great, I'm sending you stuff. And they would be stoked. And then they'd want to do stuff with us or they'd want to talk about our stuff in a positive way. And that goes a long way in marketing. But also fans love seeing representation in their own fans. And you see people from Nine Inch Nails like Star Wars you're like, holy, holy crap. I love Nine Inch Nails. I love Star Wars. I didn't know they were geeks. You know, it's like that kind of thing. So I think that's important. And I think sadly, that's something that isn't done anymore. And uh, maybe it doesn't need to be. Maybe, you know, people are out and proud as nerds and they don't, they yeah. aren't in the, but also, they're not slashing, in the geek closet. When you're slashing budgets at companies, stuff like that. Yeah, but keep in mind, get. I did not do any of this with a budget. This was all stuff that was collecting dust in the closet. Okay. And I had free postage from work. That's the only thing they were paying for is postage. I always did everything else. A lot of times I paid for things myself and sent them to fans or sent them to celebrities. So, I mean, I was a good bargain at Lucasfilm because I was doing this with zero budget. Now, yes, now they would need a budget or they would think they needed one. I don't think they need one, but or we had so much stuff on the shelves collecting dust. I'm like, a lengthy Can we just send approval this? process. And also we sent out crap too. I will say there was this thing where, remember the cartoon, the uh, Ewoks cartoon, we had all the animation cells, but they were like half done or they were like partial cell. And oh, yeah. these were things that were sent out to Bantha tracks. Uh, it was to the uh, fan clubs, but whatever kits were sent back to us because of addresses were wrong or they were sent to, you can't send that stuff to prisons. So prisons addresses were sending stuff back. And I'd be like, oh, we have piles and piles and piles of animation cells of the Ewok cartoon. I'm going to send this out to celebrities because I think it's funny. So I was sending it to Conan O'Brien and Fallon and like all these guys. They're probably like, what the hell is this? And I'm sure it was like somebody in their writer's room was like, oh, I know what this is. And then it became a joke. Please but we were sending them to comedians. And Ewok. So. Oh, Seth got so much stuff. Are you kidding me? I sent Seth so much stuff. I, that's probably why he became my friend. <laughs> Because he's like, oh, I'm gonna be friends with that girl. She has all the good stuff, and we're still we're still friends to this day. I mean, Seth is a genuine Star Wars fan, and he's genuinely a nice guy. And well, good. Well, I tell him to come on. I want to see his top. Oh, five his collection, his collection. Star Wars sells. In his he's probably. I would say him and probably Freddie Prince Jr. I'm trying to think of all the celebrities that have major stuff. Uh, there's so many fans that are that have stuff. I don't know if Pat Oswalt has a bunch of stuff. I would assume he does, but. There's a lot of celebrities that have bookcases and bookcases. Well, well, I know tell, Adam Green. Adam Seth Green does. Drag his butt on this show and we'll talk. Yeah. I mean, I will. Uh, I'll definitely, you know, talk to some of my friends that have massive collections that are much more impressive than. I mean, I've got a lot of stuff, but it's scattered all over the apartment. I don't I'm have also... it like you do where it's like right front and center. Well, this is also yeah. the view you see. <laughs> it's, it's not. I mean. But there is. A I mean, lot you can see stuff. It's just that my my shelves are color coded, and then I have a lot of like gothy Halloween stuff everywhere, and uh, it that's also a mix of Doctor Who. And I don't I don't organize it by genre. I organize it by who I think looks funny next to each other. So I have, you know, R two D two toys next to, uh, you know, uh, Godzilla toys, oh, which I, I also collect a lot of, I'm and a lot of Doctor Who toys. Oh, and I, I have, love like, juxtaposition. I love. Yeah, and I have like Thunderbird toys next to like Chewbacca, and you saw. I mean, Enid as you see, this World. stuff is all over the place. This is yeah. not. Yeah, I mean, like my job of the hut. I have a job of the hut that's right next to my Godzilla and their buddies. Like that's that's a buddy movie that could happen. Would be. It's like be. Ready Player One when you watch the Ready Player One movie and all of those characters are intermixed with each other. It's like, yeah, that's my apartment. That's yeah. what that I looks mean, like. I mean, you've seen my desk photos. You've yeah. Seen, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's another, there's a, there's another TikToker, Instagram YouTuber that I love called Nerd Burger. 
uh, like nerd than burger, like hamburger. And she's out of Australia and she has a setup like yours, but then all of our walls are painted in the Simpsons colors. So it looks like she's in that living inside of the Simpsons house or inside of a Nickelodeon cartoon, but she's got everything, everything. And I'll send you a link to her stuff. Yeah, you should please. interview her because she's, she's got a collection that's amazing. And she would be a fun interview because she works at a comic book store and her husband is a toy designer as well. And that's, I'm, I'm always astounded at everyone's collections and how unique they are and how over the top they continue to be. And I, and they're all adults. They're all adults like us. And I love that. And it's fun to see people's collections. Cause I think you could tell a lot about a person from what they collect. So, uh, and how they show it, how they showcase it. Yeah. So, well, and yeah. also, you know, I, you need to do a collection tour at some point. Uh, I will. I stuff. keep meaning to do a tour because I have, also have weird taxidermy. I, yeah, I love the glimpses we've gotten just in conversation. <laughs> yeah, if you go like I the do tissue have box, a... like the yeah. Like if the... you if you uh if you go on my Instagram, it's Bonnie Girl, which I am on all social media. So it's just B O N N I E G R R L. Uh, you you can see my Instagram, and I have a section called uh, Shelfies, which is just all my shelves, and then I have a, a highlights section that's also called Home Decor. And so I show you different parts of my apartment, but it's, it is a hodgepodge of action figures, crafts, uh, gothy Halloween stuff, but also taxidermy. Like I have a, I have a, a, a raccoon that's a Devo raccoon. So he's dressed like the lead singer Devo. And I have like, uh, yeah. And I have a ton of, got a ton of Kaiju stuff, um, a ton of just weird, just weirdo stuff. And it's stuff I've collected over the years that I just, I live, you know, I, I can live however I want. I don't have a spouse or kids, so I can make this look as weird as I want. So well, I always joke that if anyone broke into my apartment, they'd probably be really creeped out because I also collect Ouija boards and I have those everywhere. But I also collect creepy dolls and creepy puppets and they will be things so that look excited. like Annabelle or things that would be haunted. So, you know, you would have someone who broke in who just would be, still be there. Yeah, they would be staring at everything. Yeah, probably. like this is awesome. This is oh, I came here to rob you. Oh, or they'd be like, why is there a mouse dressed as uh, a cowboy right next to another mouse dressed as uh, Batman next to another taxidermy mind. mouse next? To, <laughs> yeah, like it's just my my taxidermy cosplay. So basically, it's just a really strange mix of everything. But it's it makes sense to me. And it makes me happy, and Something I think that's all you, that matters. That you should probably hang out more with Guillermo del Toro and compare notes. By the way, if you can, I highly recommend googling his name and house tour or looking at the book that he published of his office. Um, it's, I, it's called uh, not Bleak House, but it has a name to it. I can't remember the name he calls it. It's he collects high end, and so does um, a lot of people. I uh, I know that Chris Hardwick and Lydia Hurst, they also collect horror film props. Adam Green does, who I mentioned earlier, who is a movie director. They, But get, oh, the Toro's collection of movie props from all of his movies, by the way. But also, he has a life-size Frankenstein of Boris Karloff off the chair getting his makeup applied. Well, he, has, he also has Peter Cushing and like he has Oh all my God, horror. he has the most amazing collection. And if I ever but can get also a tour of his place, oh my God. A tour from conan yeah conan yeah conan's in there go look yeah. up on youtube yeah and what and it, was it a cameraman that broke one of the pieces yes yeah 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 i mean that's what you have to look out for right if you're in someone's house and they and have just see guillermo nice. as a collector and you can yeah. see the look on guillermo's face when he's like it's fine yeah. it's, it's i mean fine. it's also like i wish i had that kind of money to have large scale stuff everywhere i would probably just make it myself and it would look a little janky but like I, I know Bill Prady has the life size Robbie the robot in his house. It's amazing what money it's amazing. will get you. <laughs> but also Adam Savage has a lot of stuff too. Oh, like yeah. Adam, and he has a tiny place in San Francisco, like tiny compared to these LA sprawling mansions of stuff. But yeah, it's just it's amazing to me. Like if you have the money and you're a geek, like I would love to see what Elijah Wood's place looked like because I know he's a super geek. I know that. You know, you have all these people that love these movies and love these genres of things. Of course, if I had like that kind of money, when you would do a, you know, not MTV Cribs, but that doesn't exist anymore. But Architectural Digest has been doing some really cool celebrity tours of homes. And when you see some of these people's homes, you're like, why does Bella Thorne have a life size like a uh, raptor dinosaur just hanging out in her living room for no yeah. reason? Because other than she just liked it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's how I would be. I would totally be like that. I am like that. I just don't have Bella Thorne money. Yeah. <laughs> Yet. 
yet. That's, that's, that's for all of us. Yet it'll happen. It'll happen. But God forbid, if I ever win lotto, it's not going to anything useful. <laughs> and until then, it's it's Emperor Appleteen. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. I hope hey, that this has not been a horrible interview. It is not. <laughs> no, I mean this is exactly what I was hoping I hope your for, which was like, to have you on? on the show and to talk to you about all this stuff and just catch up. Yeah, and this I, is all I, mean, I wanted. I like this too because we're friends, and also you know you you've known me forever, so you know what I'm like, and you know the stuff that I did at Lucasfilm and the stuff I'm very, and I'm also very proud that I had that legacy, and I love I love Star Wars, I always will. So. You know, even though I don't work there anymore, it's it's still it's still something I love, and it's still something I love talking about. So, and you've done you know, amazing I, books, yeah, at, which are all available. You can people, buy all of them. I mean, even some the of them, some of them might be out of print. I here, let's do let's do just a quick rundown. So you've got you've got the Star Wars craft book, right? Still available on Amazon. Uh, you've got you can draw Star Wars, still available on Amazon. Uh, and other stores, by the way, mom and pop stores, go support your local stores. Uh, you can draw Star Wars, the Clone Wars. And then this is actually still in print. It's uh, a Clone Wars easy reader called uh, Star Wars, Clone Wars, Pan Planets and Peril. That's really hard to say fast. But this is um, because it's sort of a guide. Those other books, those other books right? were considered uh, the other books are considered legacy books because they were published before Disney took over. But this, because Clone Wars came back, uh, Disney republished this. So you can still find this. And this is like, these are these easy reader books that you would find like at Barnes and Noble in the kids section. And it's like in the learn to read section. They're like numbered. I think this is number four. So they're like numbered based on your reading level. So I did, I did one of these. And that's so, sort yeah. of a guide to the different <laughs> planets featured in Clone Wars. It's um, it's actually like fiction. Battle zones, it's, right? So it's like it's like this kind where it's like pictures from with words, but also, you know, like Wikipedia kind of entries where right. There's, but it's basically like, all the different planets that people would encounter yeah, in the yeah, show. Yeah, and but also it tells you why they encountered them and what was going on there. I mean, it's a fun book, but um, yeah. I mean, I'm proud of those books, and then I have other stuff. But I can't remember what it and is. The but that's with stuff. feminism book as well oh yeah yeah, yeah. so the bed. crafting the crafting with feminism book uh this is one of two books i get residuals on the other one is a girls against girls anti-bullying book which is also still for sale um you could just look me up on amazon and you can see my author page and all my stuff's on there and my comics are on there and other stuff so and also on your social media uh, you have a link tree that features all the stuff and the games that you've done and oh yeah i did a magic the gathering murder game i did a murder mystery game i did um a bunch of hunt a killer the only problem is i've noticed on instagram uh if i try to promote anything with the words murder or hunt or killer the ai bot that is now in control of all of instagram um community standards will put me in Instagram jail for, and I quote, inciting violence because I am using keywords that the robot, you would think being married to R2D2, I'd get a pass, but no, uh, the AI bot so, uh, at, tends to be a little, little touchy with at, certain keywords. So, so when promoting, I'm kind of curious now, if you were to put like the M in that word in parentheses, within that word. So it's clear to anyone reading it, what it's supposed to be. I What I've been doing is I'll either use leet speak, right? Where you use numbers for words because it fools the algorithm and it fools the, the AI bot. Right. Or I'll just put mystery game instead of murder mystery game. Um, that's the only, and also I can or get away with it on mystery game. Well, I can do it on stories and reels, but I can't do it on actual on post. Instagram posts. TikTok doesn't care, by the way, uh, and Twitter doesn't care. So it's only and Facebook. Well, we doesn't know care. we know Twitter doesn't care. Well, Twitter doesn't care about anything. Yeah. Uh, but also Facebook doesn't really care that much either. But I would say Instagram is where they're getting really kind of touchy with the the AI community bot, which I still think is a mistake. They swear up and down that they have people in charge, but I know they don't because I'm on Instagram 24 seven, and I can tell when a robot is deciding things and not a human because. I've been a community manager since the internet began. So I know when it's a robot. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's no frustrating, but left, at Bonnie. the same time, there's no humans left. There's no humans left. I know. I, I keep applying for manager jobs at community, like at video game companies and stuff to be community managers. And I'm like, 
I know they just want to replace us all with robots, but here's the thing. Robots don't, they're not good in disputes and they're not good in, to argue with. So if you keep pissing off and upsetting your, your customer base and your fan base, they're going to leave and they're going to go to whatever social media platform isn't horrible to them. But here's the one constant. Executives don't learn. I think also it's just how much money can I save at all times because they're businesses yeah. I mean, and they think AI will solve it all. And they do on some things. Well, they've they've been everything. sold a grand bill of goods for a product that's not ready to do what yeah. it was sold to do. And they are too fast going too all in on something like this. And, yeah. you know, look at the, learn. the industry when it came to streaming. They cut yeah. off all of their other income sources like theatrical and broadcast television and that advertising because they went all in on a thing that had big promises yeah. but wasn't proven to generate the kind of revenue that those other things. So, you know, and also to keep with like the Star Wars theme, uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And as long as humans exist, they're going to find ways to create cool shit and, and consume it and produce it and sell it that benefits them as long as they can. And if this platform doesn't work, they create a different platform that does. And I do think that that that's still to come. So even though the AI is sort of seems to be taking over everything, they haven't taken over everything. And I think that DIY punk rock spirit is kind of coming back, especially through Gen Zers and alphas, Gen alphas. I'm seeing that happening. Like I'm seeing zines again, like actual printed zines. Right. Um, I'm seeing like kids wanting to make their own stuff. I'm seeing a lot more Luddites. I'm seeing a lot more people saying, I don't want to be on social media anymore. It's sucking up too much of my time. It's ruining my self-worth. Um, so I'm starting to see a pushback. So we'll see what happens. But I think as long as there's creative people out there, though, they're going to be doing creative stuff. And as long as that happens, I'm there. I'm you know for it. They, so. You know what they should be doing? They're going to be mm -hmm. making an Admiral Sackler. <laughs> or an Apple Teeny. Or a... Uh, Emperor Apple Teeny. I mean... At, with yeah. an apple teeny on the side <laughs> while drinking an apple teeny yes yeah there you go sorry i don't know why i said apple teeny because you're that's thinking great. of an apple teeny right now that's a different that's a different book that i have yet to write apple uh, teenies right. with apple teen it might happen i might do a galactic cocktail book i know that there's a few out there sort of but not really because they want to make them kids friendly so I don't know. we'll see there's yeah, anyway. always room for more booze. Oh, you know who else you should have on your show is uh, J uh, JC, the guy that runs Scum and Villainy bar here in LA. That's the Star Wars themed bar. He has a, a massive collection of cool stuff too. So I'll just talk to everybody and say, yeah. hey, just go bother bother you. I, I'm Get here to show. be bothered. Uh, <laughs> and I, but thanks I, for having me on. I'm I appreciate so it. I'm so glad that you came on the show. Uh, and... Thanks also for having other women on your show. I watched the other episodes and I was delighted to see some diversity there so thank you for that it is that's I important mean, it, it's both important and it's such an easy thing to do yeah to, yeah i agree i agree I'm, I'm here to talk to whoever about everything because it's fun to have these conversations with folks, i agree so. cool so i right. hope to continue to do it more everyone go follow bonnie on all of the things go buy yep. all of the books and play all the games and do all and the you things. can also google my name and find me there i mean i'm kind of everywhere online i don't leave online ever so <laughs> you can probably find me every i think there's even a wikipedia entry for me uh and also wikipedia but i don't control any of the things that are said on there so hopefully they're nice and not mean but the wikipedia is fun because you can find out what comic i was killed in by darth vader and also how long you've been married to r2 it's been a while like i feel like are we on our 20th you have to be very close to the 20th Actually, I think we're at our 25th. I need to find out what, uh, that might be 25th. I might have to do a video. I'm going to have to figure out a video. I'll, I'll figure out an anniversary video. And also get that documentary <laughs> together. Yeah, no, I yeah, I need to get that footage. I'll have to find our documentary team because they don't work at Lucasfilm anymore. So I don't know even, I don't even know if there is where the footage is. It's probably in some well, janky you know, archive. You, you, it's probably in a zip drive just somewhere. Walked, you just worked with some documentary filmmakers on a thing. Let's I know if they can find behind the scenes Star Wars holiday special stuff, they should be able to find this. I'll I'll, I'll ask around and see if there's where that might have ended up because I, I know it's still at Lucasfilm somewhere. Or so. you could just ask your husband. He'll never <laughs> tell. It's probably in his hard drive somewhere with all the is other it, isn't secret everything videos. I mean, come on, that guy 
that guy records everything. So I'm sure he knows where the bodies are buried. Yeah, no, I, uh, I'll get on that right away. I need to find out because time is elusive to me. So I need to figure out exactly what our anniversary date is and then do something fun for it. Maybe I'll do something fun for the May the 4th celebration too. I don't know. I don't want to add on to my to-do list, but we'll, well figure something we'll out. We'll see that Admiral Sack part. Well, I, <laughs> I thank you again. And I want to thank everyone for watching this. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. This is my awkward spiel that I always try and get through at the end. Uh, where I say, if you want to support me, you can go to patreon.com slash Ken Plume. I love that sec part. <laughs> uh, you can go do that. You can also do uh, the like and subscribe thing on YouTube, which I guess people do as well. Uh, there's an Amazon wish list. If you want to look through that, that's down in the links. Uh, there's another show coming up that I'll be announcing soon, in addition to Force 5, which is sort of a spinoff of this and also a bit of a chat, which is the podcast that I do which has over 500 episodes, which I'm going through and putting up uh, online on YouTube for easier access because people seem to have lost track of it. I'm also speaking to you who are going to go find that uh, Cat Fancy George Lucas interview. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know which through... box. I don't know which box that's in. It's, it's that's in the in same one as the yearbook. It's, uh, it's somewhere in storage. I don't know where. I've been going through with the interviews that I haven't released that never mm -hmm. got released for some reason I did with folks, some of whom have passed away and I'm releasing those through my Patreon. Uh, I just did one with Renee Arbergenois that I, for nearly 20 years has been unpublished. That was a big, massive multi-hour conversation with him uh, that was released. So I'm going through and remastering and getting those salvaged and released. So more of those cool. to come. Thank you all for watching this edition of force five uh and bonnie thank you everyone thank you bye everybody oh no bye malakili <laughs>